All right, we're going to go back on the record. Mark Jensen, 2002 CF 314. It is January 25th, 2023. Let's have the appearances, please. Good morning, Your Honor. The State of Wisconsin appears by Special Prosecutor Robert Jamboys, Deputy District Attorney Carly McNeil, and Public Service Special Prosecutor Beverly Jamboys. Attorneys Bridget Krause, Jeremy Perry, and Mackenzie Runner appear on behalf of Mr. Mark Jensen, who appears in person. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. I'm uh, very happy everybody made it in today. It is slippery out there, and I appreciate the effort, even the, uh, the attorneys and everybody else. Uh, it was not an easy drive this morning. But I think this morning is going to be the worst part of the day. So, But I will give you extra for lunch today if you need to travel, too. So. Okay, let's take a lunch break. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. All right, uh, we are then in the defendant's case. Uh, Ms. Crozzi, who is the next defense witness? Mr. Paul DeFazio. All right. All right, Dr. DeFazio, if you could remain standing, raise your right hand, I'll swear in. You solemnly swear the testimony in this manner be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you, God. I do. Thank you. Try to get as close as you can to the microphone. And if you could spell your first and last name for the court reporter. Paul, P-A-U-L, DeFazio, capital D-E, capital F as in Frank, A, Z as in Zebra, I-O. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Crowley. Mr. DeFazio, what do you do for a living? I am a psychotherapist. And how long have you been a psychotherapist? Approximately 51 years. Um, and where do you currently practice? I practice, uh, I have an office uh, on Green Bay Road. Uh, it's um, 6125 Green Bay Road in Kenosha. And what is the name of your office? S Psychiatric and Psychotherapy Clinic. And have you been working, is this your own clinic? Yes, yeah, and a partnership with my uh, daughter, Lisa. I think you said you're in a partnership with your daughter, Lisa. Yes. And you're a psychotherapist um, by trade. Yes. I want to talk to you a little bit about your education. What kind of education do you need to have in order to become a psychotherapist? I have an undergraduate degree, and that could be in almost anything. Mine happened to be in the biological sciences, and then I have a master's of social work, uh, so I am uh, a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, since the time I graduated, which was um, 53 years ago today, actually, uh, since that time, they've made uh, changes, and, and they have the licensing is now licensed clinical social worker, LCSW. So you have been a, you got your master's in social work in January of 1950, 1970? 1970. Okay, thank you. Um, and since getting your master's degree, have you been working and practicing in the field of psychotherapy? Yes, uh, most of the time. I started uh, working uh, at one of my field placements as, un as a graduate student. I went back, they wanted me back, and I worked for the Racine Schools. Uh, at that time, and then an opportunity came with me to start a clinic with my the one who started with me, Dr. Harold Kappas, who was general practice in Kenosha and then went back into psychiatry, and I had known him for many years 
both in, in, at, in a family way, but also in others. And we started, we kind of joked and said we'd start the clinic at one time when we were both still in school. And it, it was half joking, but maybe a little serious, but we did. We started the clinic and uh, that's how that started. We talked a little bit about your profession being psychotherapy. What is psychotherapy? Psychotherapy is, uh, and I want to emphasize, I'm not an MD, so I can't order any medications. Uh, and that's why it's advantageous to have a psychiatrist that, that's in hand to be able to do that. Uh, but a psychotherapist deals with mental, psychological, emotional problems, and, uh, and one can pick their own subspecialty, uh, but I was in, basically I did a lot of general uh, uh, psychotherapy, so that would be adults, that would be some children, uh, and, and, and in family therapy and so forth. You just said that that's why it's good to have, I think, in hand a psychiatrist. What did you mean by that? Sometimes with um, in depression or anxiety, uh, medication might be needed. And so at that point, then I refer to the psychiatrist for uh, evaluation. And if the psychiatrist concurs, uh, then uh, the psychiatrist will order the medication and then review the patient's meds periodically. Uh, and then I would continue with the therapy. Do you have to refer them outside your clinic for a psychiatrist? No, uh, at the present time, and that always changes because of the who what we've had now. Dr. Uh, Newman, Dr. Kappas retired 13 after years afterwards, and then Dr. Lee Newman uh, came into the practice, and she was with us, uh, and then she died. I can't say exact, but a number of years ago. And then we had Dr. We have Dr. Ashok Shaw, and he is a psychiatrist, and so he's in our clinic. And also Dr. Babu, who is a psychiatrist, she had a clinic of her own. But then when her partner retired, she asked if she could join us, and she joined us roughly about seven years ago. I'm rounding it off, but somewhere around that time. So we have two psychiatrists in the office. So as part of your clinic, it's important for you to have a psychiatrist also in the clinic. Yes. To work with you as you're providing therapy to your patients. Correct. Um, have you seen patients over the last 53 years? Yes. And about how many patients do you think you've seen a year? Uh, as I'm getting older, it's, it was decreasing. At one time when I first started practice, I did inpatient as well. And Dr. Kappas was the MD that admitted the patient and he would have the responsibility but I would have uh, do the therapy with individual patients and at that time Kenosha Memorial Hospital had four Palmer and that was the psych ward uh, and then St. Catharines also it happened to be a fourth floor but that was at the original St. Catharines on the north side and at that time I saw many patients in the hospital and then I would do the afternoon I would go and see uh, the patients in the office for could it be follow up or could be referrals on their own. Um, in those days, this is kind of, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of transition in terms of psychiatry and mental health. And mental health was at that time a second class citizen to the healthcare field. And so as a result of that, um, we, we, things changed quite a bit during, during my practice years. And then, so in answer to your question, I saw many patients, I mean, I'm sure now into the thousands, it sounds, when I look back at it, it's, it, it sounds kind of amazing, but uh, the time did go by fast, and uh, I did treat a lot of patients. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the information you get when you're treating patients. Yes. Um, can you tell us kind of what, like, intake of a new patient looks like? Okay. Intake now it looks differently than it did back in those days. The intake, uh, one gets usually, uh, the, the secretary, the front office will get a little bit of a synopsis. Why are you coming? Uh, why, why are you requesting help? And just get a real pinpoint of, of the referral. And then depending on that um, in, our, in the clinic, it's referred to specific patients who let, or s specific therapists who at some time will say, I take, I work better with adults, or I work better with the elderly, or I work better with kids, and so forth. So at that point, they're, they're referred. Now, if they are referred to someone specific, and many times uh, a general practice, general practitioner will refer, uh, 
then they're referred right to the person they, they're referred to. So that's, and then we do an intake, presenting problem, what's the situation, and then we provide uh, options, uh, whether it's individual therapy or saying maybe sometimes your spouse may be included or how does the family feel, because it makes a big difference if we get patients sometimes that are coming and you can kind of tell, okay, the final thing happened over the weekend, now I have to, now I, I'm forced to come in. Well, you've got a, already a resentful patient, but if you have somebody that really said, you know, I've been feeling lousy and, and i just not feeling good, I got checked over, uh, physically I'm fine, then at that particular point uh, you have somewhat maybe a little more motivated patient, and so you try to describe to the patient what to expect from treatment, and we are uh, we we take a responsibility of making the patient know what what it is that we can do, and also what it is that we can't do. When you talk to a patient for the first time, do you get their past medical history? Yes. Um, do you get their past family history? Uh, we try to do as much as we can in the first visit. Sometimes we have, or not nowadays, and this again, a lot of these things have changed from when we started practice, but at the time, now they fill out a form and they kind of like past, have you been any place else before? Uh, uh, have you, when was your last physical? Uh, you know, those kinds of questions so that we, when we first see the patient, we have a little bit of a direction where, where the patient has been and a little bit of insight into what is to follow. So today you have the patient fill out a form, but in the past you've asked those types of questions. Correct, correct. And that would include questions about like family history and prior treatment. Yes. And is that both prior treatment medically and prior treatment um, as it relates to mental illness? Yes. Or therapy? Or therapy. Now, as a result of the work that you do, do you keep records of patients? Yes, we do. And the records that you keep, are they maintained as a regular course of your business? Yes. And do you maintain records for all of your patients? Yes, we do. Are those records now electronic? Yes, they're electronic, and uh, it's, it's done a lot differently. Uh, I would also say this, that um, now that we, something that happened about three years ago, there has been another little change and modification in that uh, due to COVID, we, we do virtual uh, appointments. And, uh, and mine are virtual because I have to admit, I've kept up on technology in terms of in progress in mental health areas. But in um, uh, technology aspects of things, I'm, I'm, I, sometimes I have to ask my granddaughter, how do I, if I have trouble with the cell phone, how do I do this? And she'll say, pa, and then she'll show me how to connect it with the computer. So uh, I'm, I admit where I'm lacking in there. So in mine, when I'm doing uh, virtual nowadays, I do it, but there's a definite form I fill out. Patient agrees to virtual contact and, and whatever it is. And since virtual in the last three years, essentially, uh, unless it's a real special favor for somebody, I haven't been taking new patients because I was trying to wind down, uh, still stay in the administrative part of it, but try to w wind down on the, on the patient intake. And I always feel one of the models in our clinic, and every, everybody gets to hear this, all the people that work there, patients are first. Then comes the integrity of the clinic in terms of what your indiv the provider individual needs are. So patients are first, and for that reason, I don't want to take a new patient and only to say, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not going to see patients anymore unless there's some special reason for me to do so. Back in 1990 to 1991, um, did you have a patient by the name of Julie Jensen? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about your work with Ms. Jensen. Okay. First, Mr. DeFazio, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 100. Are these the records you kept on Julie Jensen during her treatment of her in 1990 to 1991? Yes. And are these the records that were kept as part of your business? Yes. 
Now, in 1990 to 1991, those records were handwritten. Yes. Um, and it'd be fair to say that it's a little difficult to read them if you're not the person who wrote them. Correct. So I'm going to ask you to kind of look through that. Um, the first page of Exhibit 100, that seems to be a list of medications. Yes. And then the next few pages seem to be your notes as it relates to your conversations with Julie Jensen. Yes. And your appointments. Is that right? That's correct. And then the last couple of pages seem to reflect the conversations you had with Mark Jensen. Correct. So when you talked a little bit about um, the information you get from patients, one of the things you said is that whether a spouse is going to be included in treatment. Yes. And why is that something you would talk about? Many times we uh, look at a situation in terms of, a, of a, a unit rather than an individual because many times spouses can have a different view. They can be against coming in for therapy. They're, uh, they, they're, they're against the patient coming in for therapy, or they could actually contribute and be a helpful source. Uh, many times they see things, we all see things in a different way. And so when I'm sitting here now, I see the exit doors and I see uh, uh, people different. I don't see the jury where someone else is sitting. They may see the jury sitting. Uh, and everybody's telling the truth, but it's the, from the view that you're seeing it. So sometimes we, we have the spouse can be very ba valuable in terms of helping us to what the issue is, uh, whether it's the person seems to be having difficulty, uh, very depressed, and we know it's a change in behavior, or we see a person that whatever it is diagnostically, that's number one. And then number two, with the permission of the patient, we try to get the, the we encourage at times to, for the spouse to be involved because of the fact if the spouse is against it, uh, that can be very hard in terms of prognosis, a uh, favorable prognosis, because it's undermining the, the provider uh, and what we're trying to do. So it, it increases understanding for the spouse or a family. It also helps uh, uh, the provider be able to distinguish what some of the situations are in the home. So that's a question that you ask your patients on the front end. Yes. Of whether the spouse is, like, supportive of the therapy. Yes. So I'm going to ask you to go to the second page of Exhibit 100, and I believe that's the beginning of the treatment records for Julie Jensen. Yes. Um, can you tell us what the first date is that you saw Ms. Jensen? June 29, 1990. And I'm going to ask you about the notes, um, Mr. DeFazio, because your handwriting is a little difficult for me to read. Um, so I'm going to ask you to kind of go through those with us. When you're meeting with a patient, do you take notes as you're talking to them? I do. Uh, and I personally do. Some do not, but I do. And is the first meeting where the most notes are? Usually, by and large, yes, but not always. And why would that be, by and large, where the most notes are? Because we try to get some of the, the, the basic information down as opposed to, and again, there's been a change from those days to now, we used to call it soap the notes, and that was where you, you would take an assessment, then, the, then you'd have a, and it would stand, and then have a plan, so forth, right away. Now there's actually guidelines that you check whether it's on the computer or whether it's uh, um, by, by itself. So in other words, you can you actually put the goals, uh, can then the patient consent form consenting for treatment. So there's probably even more on that first one nowadays than there used to be uh, years ago. So in 1990, when I think you said the first visit was, um, the first visit was kind of an assessment and then a determination as to what the plan would be. Yes. And does the notes from that entry reflect that? Um, I myself, because it's been so many years ago, and I know uh, I have to rely on the testimony that I did almost 15 years ago as opposed to what I've done almost 30 years ago, but I, it did indicate the referral was from Dr. Paul Capelli, so I remember that he referred because we, do, we would get referrals from him, 
and obviously he felt something was in need for Julie uh, to, to come in. Uh, then I got a brief, sometimes at that point, too, uh, and it's not really contrary, indicating what I said before, but what, what we do is we get comfortable feeling with the patient and let the patient feel comfortable with us. And so as a result of that, um, there are things that we do just to kind of, if the patient feels a little bit apprehensive, maybe we won't be as judicious with the notes in the sense of writing it down in detail and, and then wait to the next time. But I did get a brief, I can see from here, uh, I got a brief summary, the, the, the one son, uh, and uh, married six years, uh, and something a little bit about the husband and the, the place of employment and so forth. And then, I, and it, then again, it, it is hard I, uh, to distinguish some of the things I wrote at that time. So at the top right-hand corner, it appears to have some basic information about Julie Jensen. Yes. Like her date of birth. I think it was uh, 226, um, but at that point, and I can't remember, it, it's blocked with the year, but obviously I did know when she was, you know, at the time, but I can't see what the, that says. I can't see it was 58 or 59 or something. I, I can't see that, but anyway... That's where, and then her address, the 9021 First Avenue. And then the next um, entry is, I think you said, a referral by Paul Capelli. Yes. And he was a physician? Yes, OBGYN physician specialty. And he referred Julie to your clinic? Yes. And then are you able to see what the next line says? Uh, I'm trying to, first baby is son. Uh, Excuse me, Your Honor, may, may I briefly approach the way? I want to see what document he's actually... Sure, go ahead. Or if you want to look at Ms. Krause's copy. You're on page two of that document, correct? The very first entry as it relates to Julie Jensen? I'm on the first... Well, actually, I'm on page... With the progress note, June 29th, 1990, I'm still there. June 29th, 1990. The very first one. Okay. <laughs> this one is right. Um, Your Honor, I don't have this page. Could we make a? Could we have the bailiff make a copy? You need a copy. Yeah. Oh, right. we'll, we'll wait a moment and we'll get you a copy. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, go ahead, Ms. Krause. So it looks like it says something about first baby son. Yes. And then does it say something around husband watch with an exclamation point? I, apparently, and I, I, it, w it would probably be what would be in my testimony um, 15 years ago, whatever I interpreted as I'm looking. It's possible here, but I can't say without, without it reasonable uh, doubt but that um, maybe the husband would watch objection, the baby. Objection, Your Honor. The witness is speculating about what the term watch means. Sustained. Mr. DeFazio, if I show you your prior testimony, would that refresh your memory? That, that pro hopefully would. What page are you looking at? Line 
questions two through four and let me know if that refreshes your memory. Well, Your Honor, under the doctrine of completeness, I'd request that also um, the, that lines 5 through 10 be read at this point. I haven't gotten to that question yet, but I'm sure I will. And if Doc, and Mr. DeFazio doesn't remember, I'll refresh his memory with those lines. Well, Your Honor, the thing is... The, the, Why don't we just read all the lines right now and then we're done? Then I'm going to read all the transcript because my concern is that Mr. DeFazio might not remember everything after 23 years, so that's why I refreshed his memory. Okay. Except that, Your Honor, immediately after that, he's indicating I'm not exactly sure what watch means. So that's, that's why I'm wanting it under the doctrine of completeness. And under the doctrine of completeness, you bring that point up right now to put that in context. How many was, lines do we have to read right now? That was going to be my next question, and if he did not remember it, then I would have refreshed his memory with that testimony. Well, because that's we, what I have to do in order to get the testimony out, Judge. Let, refresh his memory as to what you want to do, and then read the other lines right after that. Mr. DeFazio, does that rem, did that refresh your memory as to what that note said? That one does, and because as I was looking at it, it meant back to work that um, Julie would be going back to work, and the husband, that is Mark, would be the one taking care of being with the baby. And did it say when Julie was going back to work? Uh, now that that BW back to work is five one ninety, so uh, May first, nineteen ninety. And back in two thousand and eight, you were asked. Do you know what your notation about husband watch refers to after the notation about the first baby? And do you remember responding, I'm not exactly sure watch. I am not exactly sure what that meant at that time. I could only suppose what it might mean. And that is the same right now. Anything else? I think the next uh, three lines uh, through 11 through 13. Okay, do you have any reasonable understanding of what this is, or is it just merely a guess at this point? And your response, it's merely a guess. Correct. And that's consistent with what you just said. Yes. Underneath that line, can you tell what it says? Our, um, married uh, six years. And then under that? Uh, first, I think first child. And then there's a note next to that. Can you read what that says? Uh, I think it said limited postpartum depression, at least um, from what I see there. And the limited postpartum depression, do you remember if that's something Julie said or just a note you made? Uh, I cannot recall that. If I show you um, your testimony from 2008, would that help? Hopefully. So which page? I'm going to show page 92. Testimony and have you read six through eleven. Let me know if that refreshes your memory. It does. So, Mr. DeFazio, um, was that something she said to you or a note that you made? I I looked at it and, and and assessed what she said, and to the best of my ability, was the fact that she had some depression there. She I don't I cannot say with absolute certainty that she used that term, but then I interpreted the symptoms that she stated with what would seem to match. She just the baby was born within that realm of area, within that area of time that that would be understandable. And this is not an unusual circumstance to, to, for, for mothers to experience after the birth of a child. So based upon your conversation with her, it's something you were thinking about? Yes. 
and you made a note of that. Yes. Did you see some signs of postpartum depression? Basically, I believe it, if the best of my recollection there is how she presented whatever she told me, uh, whether and I, I can't recall specifically all those years ago what she actually told me, but there must have been something that would indicate that I would write that down. Otherwise, I, I mean, it's something we look for in terms of any mother that would come in recently having a baby, but it doesn't really shine a light unless there's some other things that, subs that provide some uh, substance to that that would contribute to that type of uh, f uh, assumption there. So, um, About halfway to three-quarters of the way down the page, it says something, Mom, alcoholic AA. Do you remember having that conversation with Ms. Jensen? Yes. And why would you have had that conversation with Ms. Jensen? Usually what happens is we try to get a history of the family, uh, the biological parents. Sometimes uh, we can't if, if it's an adoptive parent or sometimes they don't know much of the history. Uh, even in those days, not a lot was done in terms of the import, realizing the value of a fam family history. So uh, they're not like today's world where it's very accurate and, and can really help out. So I did ask, uh, and she did indicate that her mother had problems with depression uh, and was depressed and also uh, alcohol problems. The mother's history of depression and alcohol problems, is that something that you talked to Ms. Jensen about, if you remember, through the course of her therapy? I'm sure, I can't remember exactly the, the, the situation, but to the best of my recollection, I'm sure I, I discussed that with her because that was quite important at the time uh, for me to evaluate and treat Julie uh, in the appropriate way. Two ways, one, by how she grew up and what circumstances, and then obviously because she herself now was experiencing some obvious issues, mental issues that were of concern. And what you testified earlier is like personal history, family history is something you want to know. Yes. Um, underneath that note, can you tell what the next note is? I know it's stamped, but just wondering if you can see that next note. I think the one right above the stamp says Mother Alcoholic AA. Right, the one right below that. Um, can you tell if it says Counseling in College Parkside? It, it might, I don't know if it says Counseling, but it does say College Parkside. If I showed you a copy of your testimony from 2008, would that help refresh your recollection? Yes. Page 94. Eight. And let me know if that refreshes your recollection. So she did have the, the counseling in college at Parkside. And I know it's hard to kind of remember everything that you wrote from 1990 to 1991, so I'm not going to go through every note with you. I'm going to try to pick out some of the specific notes that you made. <coughs> um, at the bottom of that page, um, can you tell us what the note with like the little half asterisk says? I'm, I'm reasonably sure it, where it says she feels like she is the one that to do all the extra work. And is that a complaint that she had as it related to her child and her marriage? Since she's the only one there and at that particular time, uh, I hadn't really knowingly talked to anybody else about it. I would assume she must have expressed some concern that possibly, um, and it's understandable if um, after having a child, your life changes especially uh, a, a baby that would require a lot of care and there's a lot more work. So um, I, I think I'm reasonably sure that um, she, she expressed that and I put a little cross or asterisk by it by indicating 
this is kind of a flag that I need to look at in the future. As a therapist, is it uncommon to see working moms who feel like they are the ones that are taking on the extra work? Yes, because they are trying to do a role. They get home, and, and of course, sometimes uh, that can be next to impossible to try to, you can't do what you did before. It's not like getting home, taking a shower, and going to bed, or just relaxing. It's, okay, now you've got a baby, either, and even if it, there's a relative or someone taking care of the baby outside the home, still have the responsibilities because babies don't automatically stop crying because their parents need to sleep. So it's a common complaint yes. of new working moms. Correct. Or old working moms. Old working moms, too. Um, I'm going to ask you to go to the third page of Exhibit 100. And did you, can you read anything on that page about um, Ms. Jensen's comments to you about her family? Which date, I'm gonna make oh, sure second I Second page, it's the continuation of June 29th of 1990. Okay. So it says on the top, the first thing, mother, and then father, AMC. I'm gonna make sure I got the right. That's the right page. That's the right page, yep. okay. And are you able to read the note below that? Um, I, I believe within certainty women who, uh, who stay home become brain dead. I think that's... And that might have just been a note that you took based upon something Ms. Jensen told you? Correct. Um, and if you go about a fourth of the way down, something starts with husband. It appears H-U-S-B. Can you read what that says? Husband knows and is glad that is home for the baby. I'm not, I, is, is coming for help. Excuse me, now I know. Husband knows and is glad that the patient is coming for help. And is that based upon what you talked about earlier, asking her about what her husband knew as it related to her therapy? I can't really say with certainty. Um, but the note that you took is husband knows and is glad coming for help. Correct. And can you read the line under that? May be willing to come in. And is that in reference to the previous note? Yes. And so it sounds like the husband would be willing to come in. Objection. Counsel's leading the witness. Could you just rephrase the question, Ms. Krause? Does the note say then that the husband may be willing to come in? That is correct. And that's information that you got from Ms. Jensen? Yes. Now, after that, it appears that kind of what you told us before is that you would set up a plan for the patient. Correct. And is there a plan stated there? Plan to see her in three weeks, and then also see husband, get an appointment for the husband to come in. So at that point, your plan was to see uh, Ms. Jensen three more times and then see her husband? Well, at least to see her possibly in three weeks, or three more, see three times, correct. Yeah, that's right, because the time, the X is times. So see three times and then see the husband. So I would get a little feel out of a little more basis with with Julie, and then be able to have the husband come in. Do you remember what your diagnosis was of Ms. Jensen after that meeting? Yes. And what was that? Adult situational reaction with mixed features. And what does that mean? Okay. Uh, we usually, especially in those days, but even now, we, w we don't want to take a, a diagnosis on somebody that is worse than or more severe than what they have. And so this means she's an adult reacting to a situation and having features of depression and anxiety. And we all face, every one of us at some point in time will have this diagnosis if looked at. Something changes, whether it's a job or whether it's uh, moving someplace or it could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. 
but we're reacting with some depression with it and we're acting we're reacting with some anxiety so what it does is it doesn't relate to the next major one which is a possibly major depression or any or even regular depression uh, regular depression um, is like getting cut and bleeding so that if you lose somebody let's say you lost a loved one it's your one's going to be depressed and that's not mental illness that's human being being depressed because they lost somebody and physically it's the same as getting cut and again it's not that a bleeder it's the person a bleeder if you get cut you're going to bleed so at that point we would use the least amount we have to come up with a diagnosis so we use the, the least amount severe adult situational reaction with mixed features presenting the fact that I didn't want to go so far as to say the baby there's, there's po postpartum depression there for sure this was at the beginning of this situation and I didn't want to also get into if there's a chemical imbalance or some other type of situation. One of the things you had told us earlier in your testimony was that people with mental illness were kind of treated like second-class citizens. Yes. And was that a concern you had after initial meetings with patients back in the 90s? There was a lot of times um, that that would happen and uh, it was a concern and uh, that's why I alerted to patients who were seeing us that um, at the clinic that if they uh, were applying for a job and they were in the list to ask uh, definitely put down the truth if you're on an antidepressant put it down don't hide it because if they do a drug screening and they find that you're lying you'll probably get terminated but if you, you just nothing hurts the truth and if they need something I would write something saying there would be nothing contraindicated from a job and that did happen uh, it'd be interesting to see that different people, one person was apprehensive of doing it, put down that they were on an antidepressant, and their, bo their immediate boss who hired them said, oh, are you on that? I, I wonder how that works. I, I'm on this. And they were, t so they, you could just see through the years how more acceptance of the mental illness as an appropriate um, illness uh, took over. But that's why that situation was that way. In the early 90s, was there a stigma involved with being diagnosed as depressed? Uh, it was it was lighting it was getting better, but it was still there uh, for a lot of people. Depending on, uh, you know, and uh, as I think I indicated in my last testimony, we had people running for office that indic that had diagnosis of depression, and and of course that became a real issue. And whereas I think nowadays. That part of it, as long as it doesn't affect performing in the uh, in, in the in particular office, I don't think it affects as much. So there's definitely a lessening. There might be still a little, but I I don't think there's anywhere near what used to be when I started. And certainly through the years, it has improved. So one of the things that you had talked to Miss Jensen about that you testified to was that her mother was an alcoholic and something about AA. Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 101. <clears throat> what was that? Dr. Uh, Mr. DeFazio, do you recognize um, Exhibit 101? Yes. And what is that? I, and, and I, to the best of my recollection, I can't remember if I gave this to the patient or the patient had already presented this to me uh, because we didn't, I don't believe uh, that I have seen this in a lot of our records, but it indicates there. Uh, the adult children of alcoholics and the result of how they feel and react based upon the experience they've had with a parent who has problem either with alcoholism or depression and when I say depression untreated depression obviously not depression that's under control with treatment and when you look at the second and third page of that document that's the patient information for Julie Jensen for your clinic Yes. 
and at the bottom of the third page and the bottom of the fourth page, it actually has Ms. Jensen's signature. Yes. Now, did you fill this out for Julie Jensen, or did she fill it out? Uh, she, she filled it out. And can you read what the first question asks? Any recent deaths in the family? I'm sorry, on the first page. Oh. Uh, yeah. Do you mean as it relates to the dates? As of the adult children of alcoholics page, the very first page. Okay. It asks a question number one. Do I often feel isolated and afraid of people, especially authority figures? And she answered, or the answer was yes on here. And can you tell us what number two said? Have I observed myself to be an approval seeker, losing my own identity in the process? Yes. And the answer was yes? Yes. And what about number three? Do I feel overly you, frightened? Mr. DeFazio, can you speak into the microphone? Okay. Sorry, I know it's hard when you're reading. Do I feel overly frightened of angry people and personal criticism? Yes. And number four? Do I often feel I'm a victim in personal and career relationships? Yes. And number five? Do I sometimes feel I have an overdeveloped sense of responsibility, which makes it easier to be concerned with others rather than myself? Yes. And number six? Do I find it hard to look at my own faults and my own responsibilities to myself? Yes. And number seven? Do I get guilt feelings when I stand up for myself instead of going giving it in to others? Yes. Number eight? Do I feel addicted to excitement? And there's a, the answer maybe, question mark, explanation point, or just emotional turmoil. And number nine? Do I confuse love with pity and tend to love people I can pity and rescue? Maybe, question mark. And number 10? Do I find it hard to feel or express feelings, including feelings such as joy or happiness? Yes. And number 11? Do I find I judge myself harshly? Yes. And number 12? Do I have a low sense of self-esteem? Yes. And number 13? Do I often feel abandoned in the counsel of my relationships? To say yes. in the course of my in relationships? The excuse me, in the course of my relationships, yes. And number 14? Do I tend to be a reactor instead of an actor? Yes. And that's the document and the answers filled out by Ms. Jensen. To the best of my knowledge that I can remember, because I didn't fill it out, so I don't. It's not your handwriting. It's not my handwriting. It, it's readable. Right. You can read the answers. <laughs> um, Mr. DeFazio, I'm going to take you then to the next entry of July 6th of 1990. Okay. Can you read that first note, July 6th, 1990? Little support from spouse. And then the note after that? Childhood. Older brother, okay, child you have to read abuse. back into the microphone, sir. Uh, older brother, older brother, child abuse. Um, brother died when he was. I can't see if that was fifty. There, because that print is in there. I. Uh, if I showed you a copy of your testimony from last time, would that refresh your memory? Yes. <clears throat> five through seven and let me know if that refreshes your memory. Yes. Can you tell us if that was five or 50? It was five. So it's I think you testified brother died when he was five? Correct. Can you tell what the note is under that? Uh, it says, now I don't know what this, the one that says uh, Gene, but I can't remember what that was, but underneath children, and it says bad, see in one week. Does that say childhood or children? Or ch that might be child, it could be possibly childhood, if whatever it would say in that, in my testimony there would definitely be the right answer. Uh, 
On what page? Same page. That is correct. And what did that say? She had a very unhappy childhood. She felt, and uh, as she recalls it, there it was it was quite um, it was it was not a happy childhood whatsoever. Um, and under that note, is that just C one week? Yes. The next time it looks like you saw Miss Jensen was July seventeenth. Is that what that says? Correct. And are there any notes from that day? It says see in, in two weeks, but I'm not, I don't see any here, so uh, I, I'm not sure exactly. <coughs> it, 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 usually if, if a person doesn't show or I have to reschedule, I put that down. Uh, so there was neither one, so I'm not sure why that, that is blank. There's just no notes. There's no notes, yeah. And the next note is from September 14th of 1990? Yes. Can you tell what that says? Depression seasonal. Um, see husband uh, September 4th thank you that's September 4th September right September 4th yes and what does that say uh, depression seasonal see husband next week see in, and then see in two weeks meaning see her in two weeks I'm going to ask you to go to the next page of the document <coughs> I think it's September 20th of 1990 yes can you tell me what that note is Discussed antidepressant. See in two weeks. Do you know why it says discussed antidepressant? I, I felt at that time that um, I had seen her long enough to realize that I think she could use uh, uh, medication. And uh, my philosophy is, you know, don't rush to meds right away. Uh, get a feel of the patient, understand possibly what's happening, and then refer for a consultation for a, for medication and I felt that at that point I wanted to discuss with the patient and get her okay to say it's my feeling that you uh, get evaluated by our psychiatrist for meds. So at that point you as you testified earlier you don't prescribe medication. Correct. So was it your intent to refer her to your psychiatrist? Yes. And do you know if that happened? Yes it did. Can you tell what the October 8th I think that is 1990 is the next so Note. October 18th. Is this 18th? October 18th. Okay. October 8th. Um, it's in that kind of blocked text. I believe it said mental illness, mental illness mother. And then next to that to the right? Alcoholism mother and maternal father. Why would that be information that you need? Because many times um, these things can be genetic. They can, still, they can be learned or they can be genetic. And uh, so therefore, uh, we don't go into, as long as we know it's existing, but it's important to know the cause of it. But at that point, then the treatment is going to be the same, essentially, for the medic medication, whether it's genetic or if it's environmental, learned or, or whatever. So. Uh, but it, it's, it's, good, it's good to get the, the knowledge of where this is coming from. And we could see, obviously, the alcoholism and uh, the mother uh, and also uh, the maternal father. Underneath that, can you tell us what it says? It looks like in the writing there it says something about suicide. Uh, brother attempted suicide, age 17. And then underneath that? possible dual diagnosis, but never had been treated as such. And do you know if that's referring to Julie or someone else? I really can't see. I don't know if my notes would, my testimony last time, I, I can't really say. You just know that's a note that you put down there. Correct. And with individuals that are sometime facing depression and alcoholism, is it a concern that there needs to be a dual diagnosis of that patient? Yes. Um, and what's the reason for that? We don't know sometimes which came first. Um, was, was the patient self-treating with the alcohol? Because obviously short-term, uh, many times it 
it, it does camouflage or cover up the, the, some of the depression, or it definitely deals with some of the anxiety caused. And of course, obviously, if one's treating with alcohol, that's a temporary uh, solution to a, a problem that's gonna get a lot larger. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so it's hard to know, uh, since she did have uh, history with the alcoholic mother who was depressed, there was an indication it could be two things going on, but it was too early to re determine other than the fact that actually she did uh, admit to, to, his, to uh, being depressed and having some, some problem with, you could see problem with drinking. And then the next one, um, it, can you tell us what that says? Um, the possible. Says, I think it says patient denies. Okay, patient denies suicidal thoughts at this time. I could not do it because of my baby, eight months in parentheses, baby being eight months old. And based upon the baby being eight months, that's a note that refers to Julie Jensen? Uh, Julie Jensen's baby uh, okay. being eight, eight months old, and she would... She was asking suicide. No, I wouldn't do that because I have this baby and I'm not going to take my life. Are patients always honest with you about being suicidal? It depends um, on the situation. Um, many times if it's an adolescent patient, a patient can be honest, but adolescents are impulsive uh, by in, in everything else. They might, there might be a, a patient, an adolescent patient of mine who's a good student and uh, no problem in school, and all of a sudden on the first spring day, someone says to him, hey, let's go out and we'll do this and cut class unauthorized. Well, that good student, impulsive, just do it at the last minute. As we get older, we tend to realize that sometimes impulsive decisions don't help, uh, and we have to think it out. So uh, the same goes if they're depressed. If a patient is depressed and they think life is not worth living, this is no good, and you don't think of we're going to get beyond this or we're going to do this, it'll get better, so they may do something. Uh, also, the other thing that may concern something is if they're drinking heavily, just like with anything, with every, objection, everybody. Your Honor, objection, Your Honor. This is an irrelevant hypothetical. It's got nothing to do with this case. There's no indication Julie was drinking heavily. This is simply irrelevant speculation on the part of this witness about things that have nothing to do with this case. It sounds like a great cross-examination question. He's not a lay witness, so continue. So anyway, I, I did not feel at that point, I, if the question is, I didn't feel that, she, that there was any problem, but she needed some antidepressant. In your experience, patients, have you had patients who deny being suicidal and have committed suicide? Yes. And have you ever treated a mother with small children who committed suicide? To the best of my recollection, no, but I can't say absolutely. Um, so I'm going to go back to the notes. I think we're on October 18th. That's that bottom of that page. Can you read what that says? Conference with husband. Willing to be involved. And I explain situation to him. See in three weeks. Okay. And if we go to the next page, October 20. Third, nineteen ninety. Discuss situation with patient who wants to try meds, antidepressant parentheses open and closed. Husband to be involved in therapy. Ask Dr. Newman to order meds. See in one week. If you go to the first page of that document I gave you, Exhibit 100, I believe it is, there's a list of medications prescribed to Julie Jensen. Yes. And who prescribed those medications to Julie Jensen? Dr. Lee Newman. And uh, Dr. Newman was the psychiatrist on staff at the clinic. Yes. Does it say when the first Prozac was provided to Julie Jensen? It says, according to the notes here, October 23rd, 1990, Prozac.
Prozac, 20 milligrams, one after breakfast. And does it say whether that prescription was sent in or she was given samples? Samples, she was given uh, 14 per Dr. Newman. Now, as we look at the treatment rec or the medication records for Ms. Jensen, um, when was the last time Prozac was given to Ms. Jensen? According to here, uh, January 30th, 1991. Is it possible that's April 30th based upon the fact the one above it is April 16th? Oh, yes. Excuse me. I think part of it didn't come through here. So it would be April 30th, 1991. Now, when you look at the different entries as it relates to the Prozac being provided to Ms. Jensen between October 23rd of 1990 and April 30th of 1991, was a prescription sent to Walgreens or was she given samples? It looks from the best of what I can see here, she was getting samples. I, ca I can't recall. Um, I can't recall if she had gone to Walgreens or not at that time. And um, Mr. DeFazio, if you look at the page after the one, October 23rd, 1990, is there a treatment note from um, Dr. Newman? Unless the pages are sticking to, oh, here it is. I got it. And is that the patient note from Dr. Newman? Yes. It'd be fair to say her handwriting is a little easier to read. Uh, yes, very much so. And her treatment records were kept in the same um, records that you kept for Julie Jensen. Correct. When you look at the third sentence <coughs> cried all the time. Can you tell us what Objection. that says? Objection. This is hearsay. Sustained. It's a business record exception, Judge. No, it's hearsay, Your Honor. Go take a break, folks. <clears throat> All right, the uh, jury is outside the courtroom. Go ahead, Mr. Jambois. Well, Your Honor, um, when, I'm, when I start cross-examining Mr. DeFazio, I could cross-examine him on this note because it's hearsay that he, re that he may, have, may or may not have relied upon. But when a, um, the proponent of uh, expert testimony is, um, is eliciting testimony from that expert, the proponent is not allowed to reveal hearsay um, in the course of the, the direct examination of their expert. <clears throat> this is a hearsay document. This, the, note that, um, the note that this doctor made is not the note that Mr. Uh, that Mr. DeFazio made. So it's classic hearsay, and it's inadmissible um, it, during the course of their direct examination of this witness. And it's not a business record exception. I mean, a business record is something, a, a routinely recorded thing like opening up the office, closing up the office. This is a note of a professional concerning a conversation that that professional had with Julie Jensen. So it's actually triple hearsay. He's not an expert. He's a lay witness. So I actually... He's not an expert? I did not. He, we did not file an... He's a lay witness. He's a fact witness. He's the individual who treated Julie Jensen and worked with the psychiatrist in his office in order to provide that treatment. I'm not saying that he couldn't be an expert. I'm just saying that the defense called him as a fact witness. So the whole conversation about the information we can get out on direct is different as it relates to Mr. DeFazio. Second, it is 
a record kept in regularly conducted business. I laid the foundation for that when I first started talking about this. This is information that came out in the first trial per Jensen 2, statements made by Julie Jensen as to her state of mind are not hearsay, are not testimonial, they can come in. Your and this is the document that he had in his um, patient um, file. It goes towards medical diagnosis and treatment of Julie Jensen, which is also a hearsay exception. So, Your Honor, just to clarify this issue about hearsay statements, it is the defendant who forfeited his right to challenge a hearsay statement from Julie Jensen on hearsay grounds. The state has not forfeited its right to challenge hearsay statements that Julie Jensen made. It is the defendant that forfeited that right. So this still must pass muster under hearsay. And this is a hearsay statement. Now, counsel's discussion about business records, let's consider, let's take that analysis and apply it to police reports. So according to her analysis, because a police report is a record kept by the police department, then any hearsay statement contained in there is something that a police officer can testify to? That's not the law. And that's not the law with respect to business records, and it's not the law with respect to this. This statement that Dr. I think it was Dr. Newman had prepared concerning her conversation with Julie Jensen is a hearsay document, and it's not admissible. Judge, as to police reports, they're kept in the course of uh, business, but they're for the purpose of litigation, which means that's what makes them not a business record exception. As it relates to a medical file, and the notes are kept as a part of regularly recorded business, it is a business record exception, and we also have the fact that this information is being provided for the purpose of medical treatment and diagnosis. All right, we're, we're just going to stop for a second. Can I see the, um, the document, Mr. DeBrasi? Is it one page of Dr. Newman? It is. And I... Uh, I don't want to say shocked, but I, when you said he's a lay witness, he's been saying some pretty technical opinions about depression, alcoholism, talking about history, if it's in the family, uh, what therapists do. He's got a master's degree. Um, I'm not buying that argument. I was just using the court's own language from the prior objection when the court said that this is a lay witness, so he can testify as... I said he's a lay witness? <laughs> Um, as it related to the objection um, that we had at the beginning of his testimony. I understand that he very well could lay a foundation to give expert testimony about depression, but as it relates to this case, Judge, he's a fact witness. He treated Julie Jensen, and he worked with his psychiatrist in order to make sure she got the medications that were appropriate, and he continued to provide therapy to her after that date. And I have no objection to this uh, to this witness being asked all kinds of questions about his treatment and his analysis and his conversations with Julie Jensen. I object to hearsay. And but furthermore, it is true that, um, Dr. that Mr. DeFazio um, can make his diagnosis based upon hearsay documents, just as, you know, um, Dr. Mainland did, Dr. Shambliss did. I understand that. But Dr. Main Dr. Shambliss was not allowed to express hearsay through his testimony, and neither was Dr. Mainland. Um, so the, 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 for example, the St. Louis Forensic Toxicology Lab reports came in through Joe Crafasi, um, not through Dr. Mainland. Um, now, on cross-examination, defense counsel was, uh, could have brought in anything they wanted on cross-examination concerning the bases of Dr. Mainland or Dr. Shambliss's testimony. But, you know, we had this discussion, Your Honor, about um, the bases for expert testimony well in advance of trial. You, you, you probably remember that conversation, uh, the, the, the discussion that occurred, uh, the collegial conversation that occurred between the court and counsel, and it pertained to, to the letter, you know, and I felt that I, I expressed the, the view that um, the state should be able to cross-examine Dr. West about Julie's letter um, because it was a even though it was hearsay, is something she relied upon. And the court ruled that I couldn't do that. And, you know, I, I thought that was within the realm of the court's discretion to make that ruling. And we've, we've actually ab more than abided by that court's ruling. Um, however, there was this discussion about how the proponent of expert testimony 
cannot bring in hearsay documents. So I'd indicated that I couldn't bring in the, the letter through Dr. Mainland's testimony or Dr. Shambliss' testimony because I was the proponent of that expert testimony but that when the defense was the proponent of Dr. West's testimony, I can cross-examine Dr. West about hearsay, which I, I, I still can except everything except for that letter. I can yeah, cross- We're not gonna have a Jensen four. I, that is correct. And so, and as you know, I've, the, the, the state has sedulously complied with and in fact has exceeded the court's order. We've gone well beyond what the court ordered us to do in terms of avoiding the reference to the letter like it's the third rail of politics or something. We just don't go into it at all, um, even as much as we could have. I, I didn't ask, uh, we didn't present any testimony about the letter. Um, even admissible testimony, we did not present it about the letter. I don't so know we've why had this. We've had this discussion, Your Honor, about what the proponent of an expert can, can present. And the proponent of an expert's testimony cannot present the hearsay to the fact finder through using their, the, this expert as a conduit. Only the, only the, the, the opponent on the cross-examination can that be done. All right, I'll give Judge, you one more shot, Ms. Carlson. Mr. DeFazio is not on our expert witness list. He is a fact witness just like he was last time. The testimony I am getting from Mr. DeFazio is consistent with the testimony that was received last time, including the information that was in the record, the business record of the psychotherapy clinic, which included Dr. Newman's one-page report because of the consultation about medication. This is not hearsay under 90803 sub 6 records of regularly conducted activity, a memorandum, report, or data compilation in any form of acts, events, conditions, opinions, or diagnosis made at or near the time by or from information transmitted by a person with knowledge, all in the course of regularly conducted activity as shown by the testimony of the custodian or other qualified witness. That's what we have here. Mr. DeFazio, his clinic, testified that these records were kept in the regular course of their business activity and as a result should be allowed to testify, especially since he has the knowledge because he referred Julie Jensen to his in-house psychiatrist. And working together, they provided the information and the medication needed to treat Julie Jensen. This is not a proponent as it relates to an expert. This is a witness, a fact witness of Julie Jensen and her treatment testifying about records as part of regular business activity. All right, I gave the attorneys plenty of time to argue the case and I uh, appreciate your comments, but I'm gonna let it in under 90806, records of regularly conducted activity that's been testified to by this witness that uh, it is part of the information and the records that were kept by his office. So we will continue. Let's bring the jury back.
All right, we got all 16. I think we got one missing. All right, we got everybody back in the courtroom. The jury's back. The appearances are the same. Uh, Ms. Krause, you can continue with your direct. Mr. DeFazio, I was referring to you the page from Dr. Newman's notes that are dated October 8th of 1990. Yes. And the first couple of lines seem to be some general information that you've already testified to about Julie Jensen. Yes. Um, regarding her marriage and her son. Yes. Is that right? And then the second line, full line, also talks about her son. Is that what you see? That is correct. Um, and then the third line, can you read what that says? David was four mom. Does that say months? Four, four months old. Neighbor lady about her age. And then can you read the line after that? Um, that I for, first, I don't know what that first word is. If I showed you your testimony from last time, would that refresh your memory? Correct. Yes, it would, hopefully. Okay. Mr. DePazio, are you able to remember what that line says? The, the overall feeling, I believe, at that point was that uh, Julie was crying all the time. Uh, she had a lot of struggle uh, leaving for work and leaving the baby home and the separation from the baby. And then there's a line that starts, I think, with husband. Husband feels she is too emotional with child. Could it be involved? Involved. It, that's right. Involved. Um, and then the next line, can you read that? No appetite, enjoyed cooking, not, not a, well, can't read that last word there. Could it say now a chore? Now a chore. That could be very well. Is that something you see with um, a patient who might be depressed? Something they enjoyed is now a chore? Correct. That's, that's one of the things we look at is things that normally give them pleasure and happiness no longer just make them, they, they become somewhat apathetic with things and just withdraw. So that would be like a sign of depression? Yes. Objection. Counsel's leading the witness. Sustained. Rephrase it. Would you consider that a sign of depression? Yes. That's still objection. That's still a leading question. It is, but let's stick with the answer. Let's continue. Um, does loss of appetite mean anything to you? Usually that's an indication um, it, it's that there is some problem. Appetite is usually affected either it, it changes. So either there's an increase in appetite and people gain weight because they're depressed or people lose weight depending. There's no rhyme or reason, but both qualities. There's a change in, in appetite behavior. And when you say that both qualities, what do you mean by that? What does that have some importance as it relates to a diagnosis? 
it usually is another symptom, not solely would it be considered, but another symptom among others that there's depression. If you go to the bottom of that document, the second to last line written by Dr. Newman, can you tell us what that says? Chronically depressed, cry um, easily, I think and that is. So did you say chronically depressed, cry easily? Yes. And then what's the last line? DST arranged. Do you know what that means? Uh, at, in those days, again, uh, that was one of the indicators there could be to show a chemical imbalance. Um, we really don't use that now as much anymore, very seldom. But sometimes if it turns out, and it's, it's not an absolute. So if, it, if, if there is an indication of something being positive, uh, it doesn't mean uh, that much, but it's another sign. And uh, so uh, Dr. Newman, at that time, it was prudent to, to just kind of run a DST on her to see what the results would be. Do you know what the results were? I think if I, the best of my recollection, I thought they were, uh, it was normal, but I, I have to look, whatever it was in the, the last recording was the testimony that would be accurate, and I think it was normal. So if you testified last time that it was normal, that's consistent with your memory? Yes. I'm going to take you back to your notes. I think we talked about October 23rd of 1990. Do you see the next note is February 12th of 1991? Yes. And what does that say? It indicates that um, stability, emotional, I think, to the best of my recollection, if what I ever put in, in the testimony at that point, that she was stable and there was some signs of improving uh, that there was some improvement noted. And the next note, what date is that? There was a 22691 that doesn't have anything after it. It would be fair based upon your um, how you keep notes that you saw Miss Jensen that day? I, it's uncertain that I, I can't really say. There's nothing there that says patient canceled? No. No. Can you make sure you talk no. in the microphone? Nothing there that says that. And then the next note is March 12th of 1991? Yes. Are you able to tell what that says? I believe it says fight something regarding, um, I really can't read that. That's I, fair. I don't think you could read it in 2008 either, sir. Okay. Um, I'm going to take you to March 28th of 1991. Can okay. You tell what that says. Job, something of husband increase. Uh, it it's possible job loss of husband increase in anxiety, but I'd have to check out what I had at that point. See in two weeks. And if in two thousand and eight you said the same thing, that's yes. what your memory is yes. now. Yes. And then the next one it says I think is April sixth of nineteen ninety one. Okay. I, I can't uh, I can't distinguish that. I'm going to show you your prior testimony from 2008 and see if that refreshes your memory. I can't tell what this is. Yes, we're going to start joint sessions, I think it says. Mr. DeFazio, again, can you tell us again what that says? Uh, it was a time I felt that we should uh, start having some joint sessions 
prior to this, I was seeing them individually, and it was it developed to a point where it would be advantageous, I felt, to see them together. Now, there's some, a couple of more um, notes from April 30th and May 14th. Is that what you see in front of you? Yes. And then there's a, at the bottom, it looks like there's three notes. And tell me if you can tell us the dates of those notes. On the April 30th, I rescheduled uh, because of the fact that it, it must have been, sometimes what will happen is if I run way behind on, on the schedule and I don't want to have another session and just do it hastily, I, I, it's a waste of time and it doesn't accomplish anything. And then sometimes maybe the patient might be running late and then you sit there and you are all in, in therapy, most of them are time related so that if a person runs, and it can happen, a person runs 20 minutes late, and you have a 45-minute session, uh, you can't get done what you're supposed to, so we just kind of re reschedule it and, and so forth. So uh, the IRS stands for I, I rescheduled, no charge, because if, if, if it's something that I, that I do, I don't charge the patient the, the no-show fee or whatever. And, and then May uh, 28th, is that the same thing? Yes. It says IRS, is that right? Correct. And then... There's a June 4th, 1991 that I'm not going to ask you about, and then a June 18th of 1991 right under that. Do you see that? That's correct. And do you know what that says? Patient doesn't feel progress, and I can't read that on, on the bottom there. Um, if I showed you your testimony from 08, would that refresh your memory as to what that note yes. is? Page number. I'm going to look at lines 21 through 23. Let me know if that refreshes your memory as to that. Yes. And what did that note say, sir? Based upon what I wrote there, uh, and at that time, uh, I should note since I'm referring back, everything I did after the testimony of, of, of during the February tw 2008 uh, hearing, I feel comfortable with when I left when I left the testimony. So I, I believe at that time. The patient had indicated things weren't moving fast enough, and uh, they were thinking of, or she was wanting to get another therapist. Um, do you know if Ms. Jensen got another therapist after that date? To the best of my recollection, I, if I, whatever I had indicated there, uh, but I, I can't think of it as we speak today, I can't recall. Um, you don't see any referral notes or notes as to another therapist on there? Or do you see any, I guess I should say? I don't, I don't see any right here. If we go back to that first page of the document, as it relates to the medication that was prescribed to Ms. Jensen, um, what was the last date that medication samples were given to Ms. Jensen? According to uh, here, uh, January 30th. Is that April? Uh, Oh, excuse me, that's right. Well, there was something here. Uh, that is April because I can't. It, the writing comes out as, as a 1 instead of a 4, but I'm comfortable with, yeah, April 30th, 1991, and it was the Prozac 20 milligrams. And that was the typical prescription for Prozac in 1991? Yes. Now, during this time, you had um, some, did you have some meetings with Mr. Jensen? Yes. And do you remember how many meetings you had with Mr. Jensen? I can't recall exactly. If you go to the last two pages of the document, are you able to tell from the dates and notes how many meetings you had with Mr. Jensen?
possibly four. I wouldn't say with total certainty, but whatever I indicated in, in the record there. There's a number of times from the document that Mr. Jensen rescheduled, or you rescheduled? Yes. I'm gonna refer you to the June 18th, 1991 note, which you just talked about as it related to Julie Jensen, um, determining that it wasn't moving, progress wasn't fast enough. Is there a note as it relates to Mr. Jensen? That I don't recall. Do you see the note there, June 28th, 1991? June 18th, you mean? June, June, June 18th. 18th? Yeah, yes. June 18th. And can you tell us what that says? Patient canceled, no charge, wants marital therapy, important, husband please, but something follow her, di her directive. I, I can't exactly say what that says in there, but the first part I know, patient canceled, we didn't charge, want, wants marital therapy, uh, impatient or important, it was either important or impatient, husband pleased, but something follow. Does it I say but know. will follow wife's direction? I think that, that makes sense, yes. And the first time you met with Mr. Jensen was on September 11th of 1990. Yes. And did you describe his wife at that time? Uh, I, I can't say whatever I put in there to the best of my recollection would be in there in the, in the testimony that I did in 2008. If I show you that testimony from 2008, would that refresh your memory as to what that note is? Yes. I, I objection, Your Honor. Any statement that Mark Jensen made about his wife is hearsay. It's an exception under 908. No, it's not. Oh, it's regularly business record. No, Your Honor, it's a hey, state. Hang on, hang on. Guess what? We're taking our morning break, folks. Jury is outside the courtroom. Uh, first of all, Ms. Crosby, which uh, statute did you say the exception was? The same one that we talked about last time, Judge, the business record exception, which would make this not hearsay. I'm not asking Mr. DeFazio what Mark Jensen said, Julie Jensen said. I'm asking Mr. DeFazio what his records indicate Mark Jensen said on that day. Which, which means, Your Honor, it's clearly not a business record. It's not a record of his regularly conducted activity. It's a record of what Mark Jensen said to him. That's not a regularly conducted activity. That's Mark Jensen's hearsay statements about his wife's condition. It's not a regularly conducted business. It's not, a, it's not anything to do with the conduct of their business. It's Mark Jensen's hearsay statements about his wife. Yeah, but he went to see this gentleman, and this gentleman wrote n notes. That's his own notes. Well, what was said? Your Honor, just let's get back to this notion about police reports again. Police reports are also business records. Business, they don't come in, however, the business records, the police reports that contain hearsay statements of witnesses are not admissible simply because they're in a police report. And hearsay statements that are contained within a business record are not admissible. The record itself of a regularly conducted activity like opening the office at, at 8.30 in the morning, closing the office at 4.30 p.m. Those are regularly conducted business activities. But statements that people make within the context of a business, that doesn't make them automatically admissible. Now, if a statement is made for purposes of medical diagnosis or treatment, when Mark Jensen's talking about his own condition, that's a statement for medical purposes, for treatment, for purposes of medical treatment or diagnosis. But this is Mark Jensen's hearsay statements about his wife. Go ahead, I'll give you a chance to respond. Police reports are business records, but they don't fall under this exception because they're made for the purpose of litigation. 
the records that Mr. DeFazio and his clinic kept, regularly conducted business records, are not made for the purpose of litigation. I already read 90803 sub 6. This fits within the exact same exception as the previous records. These were kept by his business. These are not writings of Mr. Jensen. These are writings of Mr. DeFazio kept as part of his business records, and I already laid the foundation for those. So, Your Honor, the state can admit we'll any give you of, one more time to argue. The state can admit any of the defendant's statements that we want as a statement by a party opponent. These are statements by a party opponent. The fact that they're made to a, a third party doesn't make them anything other than statements by a party opponent. Mark Jensen's statements to this person or any other person are, are Mark Jensen's statements. So the state can admit them as a statement by a party opponent, and the defense cannot. Judge, that exception statement of a party opponent is a different hearsay exception. I'm not arguing that one. I'm talking about the hearsay exception under sub 6. All right, we're going to take our break after this. Um, does the jury take in their break? Uh, I'm going to let it in again under 90806. So it's coming in. Let's take our 10 minute break.
dice for the jury? Sure. We're back on the record, Mark Jensen, 20, uh, 2002 CF 314. The appearances are the same. The witness, uh, Paul DeFazio, is still under oath. You can continue, Ms. Uh, Krause. Thank you, Judge. Um, Mr. DeFazio, I'm going to take you back to that September 11th, 1990 note on Mark Jensen's um, record. I think it's the very first one. be the second to last page oh. right do you have it there yes and can you tell us what the first line of that September 11th 1990 treatment note says conference with husband and then the second line wanting to make changes and the next line dropped out of nursing school um, and the line after that highs and lows the next line Life, I can't distinguish that next word. And then the note under that? Fixed on sun, seven months. And the line after that? Stopped breastfeeding. And then the line after that? Fears that she will end up like her mother. And then under that? See in three weeks. And would it be, is that the first meeting that you had with Mr. Jensen? From your I, records? From best of my recollection, I can't say absolutely for sure, but if, if it would be revealed in the last testimony. And, but that's the first notation as to Mr. Jensen's record? I think so, yes. And you already told us about the June 18, 1991 notation, which is the last time you actually saw Mr. Jensen. Is that right? Correct. One of the things I asked you about at the beginning of your testimony was whether you have ever had a mother with a young child commit suicide. Yes. Do you remember being asked that question um, in 2008? Uh, no, I don't. If I showed you a copy of your testimony, would that refresh your recollection? Yes. I would say at this point, I remember saying that, but I don't remember the, I can't, I don't see anybody in terms of that in my face that I can recollect. So in 2008, your testimony was that you did have a mother with small children commit suicide. That is correct. What you're telling us is today you can't remember who that would have been. Yes, that's correct. That's all I have, Mr. DeFazio. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jamboys, are you doing the cross? I am, Your Honor. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. DeFazio. Good morning. Now, um, you've been in practice, you said, since 1970, right? But practically private practice and since 1971. So 52 years. That's correct. And in their 52 years of practice, um, how many patients have you seen? It's kind of amazing to count since I don't have a, I never anticipated being in this long, but um, uh, into the thousands. And you don't remember any, every one of them, do you? That it, right. As you're sitting here today, do you have any recollection whatsoever of Julie Jensen? Yes, I do. Um, and so you have some recollection of her, and then you're looking at your notes concerning her? Yes. Do you have a very clear recollection of it, or is this just a vague recollection of? A vague recollection. Um, might it help you uh, 
if you saw a picture of her, might that help uh, refresh your recollection further? I have seen recent pictures, and yet I recollect a little more. But again, the details of that having been um, that many years in the 1990, 1991, uh, I, I don't know. I can't say with certainty that if I saw her in a store, uh, that I would say hi, Julie, and know her. Uh, well, you know, you're not going to see her in a right, store. Right, that is correct. I'm going to show you a document, this, I, a photograph that I believe is marked as Exhibit 1. Screen, please. Um, directing your attention to the screen, um, there's been testimony that this depicts Julie Jensen prob approximately the year 1997. Does that provide you any further uh, recollection of Julie Jensen? I would have to say no. So the person that's depicted in front of her, the little boy standing, is her son David, and he appears to be about seven years old at that point. Okay. Now, um, the last time you saw Julie Jensen, David was about eight months or so old. Is that true? Yes. So <clears throat> between the last time you saw Julie Jensen and the time this photo was taken, there's a lot of water under the bridge, right? Yes. So anything that you saw or said about Julie Jensen concerning her behavior in 1990 and 1991 um, doesn't provide a lot of insight into what was going on in her life in 1998, does it? Objection argumentative. Overruled. Go ahead, answer. Did you hear my question, sir? Yes. I have to think about that. Uh, what I would say is whatever I said in that testimony uh, in 2008 would be accurate because now the years have passed um, and what I remembered and didn't remember as far as she goes. Okay, Your Honor, I request that that answer be stricken as non-responsive, and I'll restate the question. Why don't you restate the question and the answer be stricken? Now, Mr. DeFazio, between the time that you last saw Julie Jensen in 1991 and the time this photograph was taken in about 1997, there was a lot of water under the bridge, right? Yes. And what you saw or experienced in talking with Mark and Julie Jensen in 1990 and 1991 to your knowledge, has no bearing at all on her condition in 1998, does it? Correct. Um, so, and for that matter, what Mark Jensen said in 1990 or 1991 has no bearing on the family dynamics that were at play in 1998. Isn't that true? Yes. Because things change. Yes. For example, they had another child. As you saw in that photograph, there was a, a, a toddler uh, seated on the in a car on the on the bike seat behind Julie Jensen, right? Yes. And so Douglas hadn't been born when you were talking with Julie. Yes. Now, defense counsel on cross examination or on direct examination had asked you about sometimes people don't tell you the truth when you're seeing them, right? That is correct. And that just doesn't apply to women; it applies to men as as well, doesn't it? Yes. Now. When you were seeing Julie Jensen, this was pretty much all, what's all about Julie, right? What's, what's wrong with Julie, right? She was the primary patient. Yes, and you were diagnosing what's wrong with Julie, right? Yes. Um, would you agree that a fair number of the women you see, the problem with the, that it, the women are experiencing is not the woman, it's the jerk they're married to? Judge, I, was a, I would object as argumentative. I uh, like that question. And it, I'm not making any statement. Don't take my position, but go ahead and ask the question. So does that mean the, the objection was overruled, Your Honor? It's overruled. Okay. So I'd request the question be read back to him. Um, would you agree that a fair number of the women you see the problem of the women I 
I would have to say with all respect, uh, when you add the word jerk in there, it has a connotation that I would say I, I, it would decrease uh, the accuracy of the question being in an answer. Oh, because I described the, so you, you don't think that you've in, seen any women who are married to jerks? I don't believe I said that. I, I have seen those. Well, I'm asking you the question. When you've seen these women who've been married to jerks, was that a big part of the problem these women were experiencing? It, it's very p possible it was a high degree of problem. Yeah. Now, in this case, <laughs> Julie Jensen was married to a man who thought that she was paying too much attention to her eight-month-old baby. Isn't that true? Yes. She wasn't paying enough attention to him. She was paying too much attention to her eight month old baby, right? There were changes in the situation due to the baby coming into the relationship, and obviously they would have to dilute the relationship between the two of them so that it's a possibility that the relationship was diluted. But Diluted? I'm not talking about a diluted relationship. I'm talking about a man complaining that his wife is spending too much time on the baby and not enough time on him. That's what I'm asking about. That's what... Mark Jensen complained about, right? She was too focused on the baby. Yes. Do you think it's appropriate that a mother should be focused on her eight-month-old baby? Yes. Maybe less focused on her adult man, who, a husband who's supposed to be able to take care of himself? Yes, I, th I think that that is true, but it enters in. It's not something that could be answered in a simple statement, one question. Your Honor, uh, objection. This is non-responsive. Uh, beyond the word yes, I believe that is true. He's trying to answer it, so let him finish it, and we'll go to the next question. Go ahead and finish your answer. Many times things are not so black and white in the sense that, obviously, as I discussed earlier in testimony, adding a child to the family changes the atmosphere and dynamics of the family. And then one it has to go deeper into looking at how with the family of origins, the perception of what a role a father is, what a role a mother is, and, and possibly also it's a complicated situation. What the stress factor is in terms of adding this, is it a financial stress, is it a time stretch, it, or are there some possibly other issues that come in that was – was one of the parents not really wanting to be a parent, but did it to please the other parent? So I, and it's hard for me as a behavioral person to answer the question in a yes or no. Uh, it's much like, did you stop beating your wife? Yes or no. It could be a no, not representing anything. But well, you know, I object all of this. This is non-responsive. I want him to answer my questions and not just give us a great big long lecture about things I didn't even ask him about. I'd request you instruct the witness to answer my question. Ask another question, let's move on. So you had indicated that sometimes your patients don't tell you the whole truth. Isn't that true? Yes. And um, I mean, probably if somebody might, maybe they drink a little bit more than they should, they, when they go to talk to their doctor, they might not say, well, doctor, I drink more than I should. That I mean, people will, people will kind of minimize some of the problems in their life. Yes. And that's not a good idea, is it? Because we go, to, we go to people to get treatment. We should be telling them con the complete and uh, honest truth, right? Yes. But in, in your experience, sometimes patients leave things out. Yes. Um, now, in this case, for example, Mark Jensen um, didn't tell you, you know, Doc I, or Mr. Uh, DeFazio, I have this really strange obsession with penises. He never said anything like that to you, did he? That is correct. And, and a bizarre and total strange preoccupation and obsession with penises could adversely affect the sexual relationship that he might be having with his wife, as does, couldn't it? I don't feel I'm qualified to answer that. Well, if Mark Jensen had told you, uh, Mr. DeFazio, I have this very strange preoccupation with penises, and that's affecting my relationship, my sexual relationship with my wife, uh, what would you have done with that information? I probably would have put that as a thought of possibly other issues in that area and just reserved it at that time in, in my, whether it's in the writing or in, in my mind in terms of dealing with is there some problem there or, you know, obviously is it dysfunctional or has it interfered with their relationship. So, Mr. DeFazio, the first time you saw Julie, um, you'd 
diagnosed or you had the referral for limited postpartum depression. Is that true? Yes, to rule out postpartum depression, but also uh, a dep uh, adult situational reaction with mixed features. Now let's talk about adult situational reaction with mixed features. Um, is that just a kind of a fancy way of saying, well, gee, she's got some difficulties in her life? That's the diagnosis used to indicate that, you're right. So, for example, if she was married to a self-absorbed guy who doesn't help around the house and doesn't want her spending all her time with her children, with her child, that would might be, a, a, that might reflect a determination of adult situational reaction with mixed features. With other things, yes. So with mis mixed features, it's not some of the other um, factors, or the situational factors, it's with mixed features like maybe depression? Depression, yes, and anxiety. Now, you talked about alcoholism. That was Julie's uh, uh, concerns about her mother, correct? Yes. One of her concerns about her mother, correct? Yes. Um, Julie never exhibited any signs or any manifestation whatsoever of alcoholism herself, did she? To the best of my recollection, whatever, whatever I stated on the notes of the last hearing, that would be accurate. Well, did you testify at the last hearing? Well, well you said you had partial recollection of this case, right? So, so at that point, I, I didn't feel at that point an indication that alcohol was a major problem. Well, well, Mark didn't tell you that Mark was bad-mouthing his wife to you, and he didn't say anything about her being an alcoholic, did he? Judge, I would object as to the argumentative. Why don't you rephrase it, Mr. Jim? Mark Jensen didn't tell you that he thought his wife was an alcoholic? Correct. And um, you did an intake sheet with Julie Jensen, correct? Yes. You have it in front of you? Make sure we're both talking about the same document. It's Exhibit 101. Defense counsel is graciously advising it. Under this document right here, sir. Oh, excuse me. I don't know if I have it in here. So on the bottom, uh, bottom of this page, it's signed Julie Jensen uh, and dated June 29th, 1990. Yes. And um, she indicates what you, what well, the question is, what do you expect to accomplish from therapy? And she wrote, improve attitude and self-esteem. Yes. Now, let's talk about attitude and self-esteem. Without you, you can put the document down now, Doctor, uh, Mr. DeFazio. Um, would it be fair to say that a woman who's in an unhappy marriage or an unhappy relationship with an abusive spouse might have, might need to improve her attitude and might have low self-esteem? Judge, yes. I would object as to argumentative and states facts not in evidence <clears throat> as to abusive spouse. I'm going to allow it. Go ahead. I gave you a lot of leeway on direct. Go ahead. So do you need the question read back to you, sir? Yes, would you? No, but I'll, have the re I'll ask the reporter to do okay. that. <laughs> Let's talk about attitude and Yes. Now she also indicated that there's a question, has immediate problem affected your functioning? And the answer is yes, correct? Yes. And then under, then you list things, number one, work, and she circled yes, correct? Yes. Because now we're looking back at the document again, sir. Just, I, I'm sorry, I should have made that clear to you. <laughs> 
Thanks. Um, so looking back at um, that part of Exhibit 101, um, has immediate problem affected your functioning? And the answer is circled yes, correct? That's correct. And then work, and the answer is circled yes. Yes. And number two is sleep, and the answer is circled yes. Correct. And number three is appetite, and the answer is circled no. Correct. And then four, family life at home, and the answer is circled yes. Correct. She lists her church or group affiliation as St. Paul's Lutheran? Yes. Under troubles with neighbors, she says no. Correct. Correct? And under alcoholic beverages, she's, cro she's X'd never and rarely. Correct? Correct. And have you ever been treated for alcoholism? The answer is no. Correct? Correct. And then... There's, but at the bottom, there's, um, a series of questions and epilepsy, convulsions, um, and so forth. And then under depression, anxiety, the answer is no, correct? Yes, correct. In other words, have you ever had any of the following, please circle, depression, anxiety, and the answer is circled no, correct? That is correct. And under recent change in appetite, she circled no. Correct. And that's as of June 29, 1990. Julie Jensen was not being treated for alcoholism, and she was not an alcoholic when you were seeing her. That is correct. You were treating her... You thought you were ruling out limited postpartum depression. Um, adult sit and then you were you diagnosed adult situational reaction with mixed features. And then on September 14th, September 4th, 1990, de seasonal depression, seasonal, it says depression seasonal, seasonal, is that a seasonal affective disorder? Is that what you mean by that? It's more where sometimes what happens in the fall or spring uh, depression that does exist, it comes comes out. Some people beyond just, oh, it's fall and, and I'm not looking forward to winter or spring. Oh, good, it's spring, the weather's getting warmer, no snow type of thing. So that could be an indicator of something more than the average person goes. And uh, so the, most of us happen to like the spring and or the fall. And so uh, or look at fall as anticipating winter. So it, it's a could be an indicator. Now, Mr. DeFazio, have you ever had have you ever um, had occasion to treat uh, a narcissist or diagnose somebody with narcissism? Yes, in terms of the first question. What What are the, some of the features that you observe in a narcissistic personality disorder? Pretty much by the definition, they, they're thinking as the world relates to them as opposed to as the world relates to the average person. So then, in other words, if, if you look at somebody that you know is a real good, you, you, you like that person real much, and she says, or he says to you, I, I lost my parent to cancer, and it, it's just a tragic thing. It was a fast death and so forth. You can't possibly miss the loss of that person yourself. You've never met her or him. You don't know that person. But knowing that that person uh, that you like real much is hurting, your feelings can go and extend to that person. You can feel badly that day or that, uh, that period after getting that news because you know how that person must feel. A narcissist doesn't necessarily feel that. Might feel only, oh, uh, he lost his mother now we were planning to go up north skiing, and now I can't go because he's got to go to the funeral. So for a narcissist, it's all about him. You it's, are correct. It's like the, the narcissist is the sun, and everything else is a planet that revolves around the sun. Yes. So when Mark Jensen was complaining that Julie is too involved with the child, that suggests to Mark Jensen that he's looking at how 
this child is affecting his life, right? I would say uh, uh, qualified, yes. And when he's complaining, and, and now Julie was distraught about having to be away from her baby for 35 hours a, a week. Isn't that true? Yes. She had a job that she was a 25 hours a week job, but she had to commute 10 hours during that week to get to and from her work, correct? Yes. So she had 35 hours away from her baby. Yes. And Julie was upset about being away from her baby. Yes. And Mark Jensen thought that she was just too, uh, too preoccupied with her baby. Yes. And Julie was concerned that Mark Jensen wasn't helping her enough around the house, that she had too much to do because she had to work, she had to care for the baby, and then she had to do everything else that she was supposed to do at home, and Mark wasn't helping her out, right? Correct. But Mark's concern was that Julie was too focused on her baby. Yes. So might that be a contributing factor to the situational, I don't know what they call that, situ what situ situational reaction? features. I'm Adult sorry, what? situational reaction with mixed features. Situational reaction. So the situation Julia was reacting to was a husband who thought she was spending too much time on the baby and not enough time with her, with him. I, that I was part of the situation, wasn't it? Judge, I would ask that Mr. DeFazio be allowed to answer the question. Don't you let him finish the answer, Mr. Jambos. I, I like the word con contributing to as opposed to just being the, the factor. So it could have contributed, but we can't say not enough information was known on other things to make that statement being the fact that it caused it or anything. Well, certainly, um, when we're talking about the information that's known, I asked you about this. Mark never told you any, Mark Jensen never told you anything about his, that what appears to be a very bizarre obsession with penises. To the best of my knowledge, I don't remember it. And I, if I didn't have it in the last, in my, in my testimony, I, I don't recall that. So I'm, t I'm asking, well, you understand the jury has been sitting here for a couple of weeks. They've heard testimony that Mark Jensen has like over 2,000 penis photos on his computer. You would agree that that reflects a rather bizarre unusual obsession with penises, doesn't it? Judge, I would object as to the facts not in evidence and um, the argumentative nature of the question. You're telling me the issue of the penises is not in evidence? No, that's not what I said, Judge. You just said that. I meant not in evidence. Way. That's what the question he asked. I meant the number, but that's fine. It's also an argumentative question. Just rephrase it and we'll move on. Okay, well... well I'm going to ask you a hypothetical question. Okay, hypothetically, if a man has a whole bunch of penis photos in his computer and they're organized according to files of small, medium, and favorites and they number in the hundreds, that would reflect an unusual and probably unhealthy obsession with penises, correct? Yes. I mean, whether, regardless of whether you're a heterosexual or a homosexual, it's just unusual to have that kind of a preoccupation with penises. Yes. You would agree with that hypothetical? Yes. And then hypothetically, if you were aware that the man had required his girlfriend to describe to him in great detail the size, shape, and circumference of every penis she'd ever seen, that would also reflect a rather bizarre and unusual preoccupation with penises. Yes. And that kind of a bizarre fixation or obsession could certainly adversely affect the relationship that exists between a man and a woman, couldn't it? Yes. And so that could also be a contributing factor to this reactive adult, adult situational reaction, correct? Contributing, yes. A contributing factor. So when was the last time you saw Julie Jensen? I believe it was in 1991. Was that about whatever that date was? And when 30? did you last see Mark Jensen? 
I have to look at what the, what the record would say. It's probably there. I don't. Possible in June or July of 1991, June June or July. I, I would have to look at the exact. Now, you indicated in one of your notes that Julie, uh, toward the end of her treatment sessions with you, she was talking about going in a different direction. Is that yes. true? Yes. Could you pull up that note, please? I can't really locate, if you could locate that for me so I could see it. I would, except I didn't have that document, so council had a second. What page was it? I didn't have that one. I didn't have that one. I'm asking about. I think I just found it June 8th, June 18th, 1991. And what do your notes reflect, if you can read it? Canceled, wants marital therapy. Uh, husband, please, uh, but will follow. He was pleased, apparently, with the current treatment, but he was going to follow whatever she said, that, that directive, at least the summary of what that note says. So that was Mark's, that was Mark's st statement, not Julie's statement. I can't recall who said it and whether it was a, Right here, I said patient canceled, but sometimes maybe by phone. I, you know, I'm on. This is a testimony here. It could be that the patient canceled and said, "I, I'm, I'm seeking other help. I can't, I can't recall that." And whatever I had said in the last uh, testimony would be the valid answer. I felt comfortable with. Wants marital. Therapy. So June 18th, 1991, says something canceled. What do you Pat patient canceled. Wants. Marital therapy. I think that says important. Important, it's important, important or, or impatient. Maybe, maybe it was impatient, I can't tell. So it's either important, maybe impatient. Husband, please, but will follow. Um, wife's, wife's direction. direction. Are, are we on the record or are we asking I'm, I'm asking him questions about, yes, and I'm hoping this is on the record. It's All about right. uh, Exhibit 100. And as you're, as you're sitting here today, um, do you know if that was note was based on Julie's conversation with you or Mark Jensen's conversation with you? I can't recall.
Were you aware that on June 24th, 1991, Julie Jensen petitioned, filed a petition for divorce from Mark Jensen? To the best of my recollection, no, unless something showed up in the testimony that I had before. Well, what I'm asking you is if were you aware, and I will indicate the jury is aware because the petition for um, divorce A petition for divorce was filed by Julie Jensen on June 24th, 1991, and you were not aware of the fact that Julie Jensen was going to file for divorce. I can't recall that. And you were unaware that earlier in the year, in, in the spring, Julie Jensen had had, a, had had a brief affair with a guy by the name of Perry Tarika. I would have to refer to that testimony that I gave but, Well, your notes don't reflect anything about Julie telling you that she had an affair with Perry Tarika or any other person in um, early 1991 and in, in the spring of They have to give the same answer that I gave the last time? Well, I know you've raised this issue before about your testimony the last I, I All I want you to testify about is what you can see by looking at your notes or what you independently recall from 1991. Now, as you're sitting here um, in 2023, it would be understandable if you don't have a specific and independent recollection of each and every entry in your reports or in your records. Um, so I, I invite you to look at your record of the times that you saw Julie in 1991. And that's the first time it reflects February 12th, 1991. Is that true? Do you want me to show you the page I'm looking at? Mr. DeFazio, would that help you? Here, I'll show you what I'm looking at. Okay. So now, so now we're on the same page. Okay, we're on the same page. Right. So your note reflects February 12, 1991, stability, emotional, correct? Correct. And under the, I can't read what it says underneath there. Can you read it? Improving. And then... On February 26, 1991, you've got the date there, but you don't write anything, correct? That is true. That is and correct. then on March 12, 1991, um, what does it say there? Fight him regarding... I can't... Outcome, I can't read that note. Okay, well, let's, let's do this. Look at the note for March 12, 1991, March 28, 1991, April 6, 1991, April 16, 1991, April 30, 1991, May 14, 1991, May 28, 1991. Just look through all of your notes pertaining to those dates and indicate to me whether or not Julie Jensen, you have any notes in there, that Julie Jensen disclosed to you that she'd had a one-weekend affair with a guy by the name of Perry Tarika. I do not see that. And certainly if Julie, if a person you're seeing for marital counseling and other types of counseling had disclosed to you that she just had an affair, that would certainly affect therapy, wouldn't it? Yes. You would make a note of that, right? Correct. And there's no note of that. Not that I can see. 
So perhaps in sometime between March of 1991 and June 18th of 1991, Julie had clearly come to a decision as to what was really wrong with her, right? Objection argumentative. Overrule, go ahead. Well, there's nothing here reflects that she was satisfied with the treatment she was receiving at your hands. I mean, she didn't tell you, oh, I've got a solution now, I'm, I'm, I'm all better. That is correct. So since she filed for divorce in June of 1991, to be specific, June 24th of 1991, it seems that Julie had come to a, a realization as to what she needed to do to, uh, to address her adult situational reaction. Objection, speculation. Overruled. She'd concluded by June 24th of 1991 that the problem wasn't Julie, the problem was the guy Julie was married to. I can only say that she was obviously unsatisfied with her situation and took steps to change it. By divorcing her husband, fi by filing a petition for divorce from her husband. That is correct. So um, in terms of the medication that uh, was provided to Julie, first of all, they were all samples, correct? To the best of my knowledge, unless um, there was something in the record, on the record, we put it in the chart if we gave samples, because obviously if it were through a pharmacy, there'd be another recording of it at that point. So I don't know. We used to have drug cards. Uh, they were large index cards that would put the medication on there. So if they were coming from a pharmacy, it would be ordered, this would be ordered. So this was samples, and they were listed as samples. And the only drug that was listed is Prozac, right? That is correct. Now, did you ever, I forgot, was this a book or an article, something called Prozac Nation? Did you ever hear about that book or that, that article? No. Well, you did, you were aware of the fact that at some point there was this discussion in the public's eye about, that there was a lot of Prozac being prescribed in a, across America, correct? There was some talk, but I can't recall the exact article that you're referring to necessarily. But there, there is, there's always been in field, in in the field discussion of medication versus the therapy, or uh, and so forth. So there, there could be some discussion of that. And Prozac it was very freely prescribed, and probably still is very freely freely prescribed in America by physicians. Isn't that true? I have trouble with the word freely. Well, if a person uh, d describes um, either adult situational, adult situational reaction or depression or seasonal affective disorder or postpartum depression, um, what's the first type of antidepressant that's most likely to be prescribed more than any other? At this point in I'm talking year, about 1991. Okay. Prozac was, was one of them. And that's the only drug that was ever prescribed to Julie Jensen was Prozac. During the time she was a patient of ours, yes. I think from what, I, from what we see in our records, I can say. Julie was talking about not wanting to be like her mother. Um, and directing your attention to, I don't know, the note above the July 6, 1990, um, you'd asked about her background, and she said, mother, home, father, AMC. Correct? Correct. And she expressed the fear or the concern that women who stay home become, can become brain dead, becomes brain dead. Correct? Do you see that up there? 
Which which page are you on now? I'll show you. Okay. I recall what you're saying, but I want to be able to yeah, see it. I want you to do so. Here, see if you can find that page. So, <coughs> mother home, mother home, property. Be above July 6th. So when we're talking about Julie not wanting to be like her mother, you've got notations here at the top of this page where there's a reference to July 6, 1990, and it says mother home, correct? Correct. Father AMC, correct? Correct. And then beneath that, there's a, uh, something that you've written here. Women who stay home become brain dead. Correct. Now, that's based on what Julie, Julie's concern was. Yes. So... When she's talking about being fearful of being like her mother, her mother had become an alcoholic, correct? Yes. And Julie had expressed the concern that women who stay home become brain dead. Yes. Now, were you aware that Julie was a straight-A student in college? Not to my recollection, no. Well, there's, the jury's seen evidence. She was a straight-A student in a, with, in a nursing program. She was a very, very, very bright young woman. Did you get that impression that she was extremely intelligent? I thought she was within reasonable, if not above, intelligence. Well, she was extremely intelligent, according to her transcript. I mean, I wish I had grades like that in college. Maybe I would have gone to medical school. But she had straight-A students as a nursing student um, when she attended college. That's reflective of a very high level of intelligence, correct? Yes. So it, wouldn't, it would be un it's understandable if an extremely intelligent woman is concerned, oh, gee, if I stay at home, you know, I'm not working. Uh, women who stay home may become brain dead, correct? It, it would be appropriate to, uh, a, cons a thought that would run through her mind. Now, is this something that she had about her concern, or was she communicating to you that that's something that Mark said? I really, um, I can't say from, from that question, I can't make an answer on that. Well, when you look down below, after women who stay home become brain dead, and then you go down below that, <coughs> you go down below that, it says husband something or other. Can you read what that says? Husband knows and is glad that... And I can't... Something is, is something for... And I, and I can't read my writing there. So I'm now I'm directing your attention to Dr. Newman's notes. Can you find those? Okay. Yes. And the benefit of Dr. Newman's notes is that we can read all of them, right? That is correct. Even you can read, doc I mean, you, I wish I wouldn't put it like this, even you can't read some of your notes, correct? That is correct. But we can all read Dr. Newman's notes. That is correct. So um, the, the, what Julie told um, Dr. Newman is consistent with what she told you, specifically directing your attention to husband feels she is too involved with child. Correct? Yes. That's what Julie told Dr. Newman, and that's what uh, Julie Jensen told you. Yes. And then she, uh, further down, there's a, do you see this notation, Mark? Do you see that? How far down? It's a right-hand side, about halfway down the page. Okay, yes. Mark represented... Emotional stability. So she's indicating that Mark represented for her emotional stability, correct? Yes. But then below that it says, once wife not to be brain dead. Yes. So it was Mark that was expressing the concern 
about Julie becoming brain dead. So when you go back to... Judge, I would ask that the witness be able to answer. Is that a question or a statement? So It was a it was statement. A I would move to strike it. Right. Go ahead and ask a question. Okay. So looking at that note, it appears that it was Julie was relating that it was Mark who was concerned. He, he wants a wife not to be brain dead. That was Julie expressing what Mark had indicated, correct? From the best of my knowledge, reading Dr. Newman's notes, I would say yes. And so then we can put that in context um, to this note that I'd referenced earlier. Mother, home, father, AMC, women who stay home become brain dead. So that sounds like very similar to what Mark was, con what Julie was indicating Mark had expressed that concern when she was talking to Dr. Newman. Isn't that true? Correct. Now, the last time you saw her was 1991. Yes. You didn't see her in 1992. Correct. You didn't see her in 1993. So I'm, I'm not going to go through it. Those, uh, between 1992 and 1998, you did not see Julie Jensen or, and you did not see Mark Jensen. Correct. So, but even though I haven't seen him since 1991, when you did see Julie in 1990 and 1991, there was no indication that Julie Jensen was suicidal, was there? That is correct. Nothing further. You want to redirect? No questions. All right. Uh, do we have exhibits over here? That we do. Yeah, we have. Sure. I'd move exhibit 100 and 101. 100 and 101 will be received. I guess I gotta put that. That's it, Mr. DeFazio. <laughs> Thank you. Next witness for the defense is a video judge. All right. How short is it? It's like 46 minutes. Well, let's start it, okay. and at least we'll get halfway through it. Okay. Yeah. And is it, uh, whose video is it? Sergeant Mark Hunter. And your list is number 12. start playing it let's try to go to like five after 12 okay and it's item number I keep making an item I'm gonna say item number seven Switch us. Could you please state your name? I know. <laughs> I'm going to. I don't know why my computer is going wider. Your name is the court.
Center and the Lakers, I'm going to start it now. Could you please state your name and spell your name for the court? Mark Hunter, M-A-R-K-H-U-N-T-E-R. Mr. Hunter, how are you employed? I'm a lieutenant with the Pleasant Prairie Police Department. How long have you been employed by the Pleasant Prairie Police Department? 23 years. 23 years continuously with Pleasant Prairie? Yes. Did you have any law enforcement experience prior to joining that department? Um, I had dispatch experience, and I also worked at Silver Lake Police Department for like eight months. The, uh, how long have you been a lieutenant? Since uh, 1999. At some point, did you have occasion to come in contact with uh, a Julie Jensen? Yes, I did. And do you recall when your first contact with Julie Jensen was? I don't recall the exact date. I know it was in 1991, 92. Um, I had been called down there several times for hang up phone calls that she was receiving. And was it Mrs. Jensen herself who was calling you? Yes. <coughs> and what did, what did Mrs. Jensen report to you when you, did you actually go over to the house or just deal with this by phone? I dealt with her, some of, it, some of it on the phone and some of it at her house, but I remember I had been there in 1991, and she wanted a phone trace put on her phone, which Wisconsin Bell had put one on, and I don't know that they ever came up with any phone numbers that were calling. And in 1992, on the um, 8th of January, 1992, I went to her house and she told me that she had re still been receiving hang up phone calls. She suspected that the phone calls might be coming from Illinois and Wisconsin Bell said that they could not set up a trace that would capture phone numbers from Illinois that were originating there. And she was getting ready to go out of town so she wanted her house put on extra patrol. And she told me that she was convinced that she thought that a Perry Tarika had been making these phone calls, but she couldn't, could not prove it. She told me that about a year or so before she had had an affair with him, and she said that she had broken it off and that she had reconciled with her husband, and she felt that um, Perry was making the phone calls. I told her that um, I couldn't prove anything, but I did tell her that I would be willing to call Perry Tarika in a non-accusatory manner and just ask him if he had been making the phone calls and that if he said no, fine, and if he had been making them, that he would please stop. And she said she asked me to do that. Okay. Let me break that down a little bit. Do you, um, so you, you indicated that this last conversation in which you discussed the possibility of calling Mr. Tarika took place on January 8th of 1992? That's correct. Do you recall how much earlier it is that um, Mrs. Jensen first contacted, first contacted you? Um, it may have been several days before, and I know that it was like the year before, and I know that there were other officers in the department who had also responded for phone calls. Okay. And do you know whether the, the um, other officers were, were dealing with a situation that occurred in 1991 or 1992, or are you referring to something that took place a little bit later? Um, I'm not sure the exact dates that other officers had had been there. Okay. Well, let me get some exhibits marked here. Lieutenant, let me, let me show you um, defendant's exhibits 295 and, and 296. Um, I'll give you 295 first. And I don't see a name of the responding officer on that. Um, I will tell you, it looks like your, your handwriting for an incident August 13th, 1991. Do you recognize that as your handwriting? Yes. Um, I think it got cut off at that it's, bottom. It's cause cut off on the, your, your signature probably would have been on the bottom. Yeah. Yes. And, and the uh, August 13th, 1991 uh, report, into, what does that tell you about the, the incident? 
And then well, why, don't I, why don't I identify the other exhibit here that you're looking at, which is exhibit 296, and that seems to have a date of August 26, 19, 1991. Is that right? Yes. And that's also your report? Yes. Okay. But can you tell me what, what was occurring in August of 1991 regarding um, any reports by Mrs. Jensen? She said that um, she and her husband had been receiving pornographic um, letters in the mail, and they had also been receiving these uh, hang-up phone calls. And um, and that, that would have been, she had called me 722 of 91. That was a different case number, 915159. And now she was calling again in August 26th or, or August 13th at 204 saying that the calls, that the uh, garage door had been opened and that some lawn furniture had been moved okay. around the yard. And she said that neither her or her husband had done it. And so this is, this is August of 1990, August of 1991. Correct. All right. Then the next, the next contact you said you had was on um, January 8th. Yes, sir. Okay. And did you, in fact, call Mr. Tarika? Yes, I did. Where was he located? He worked at Dean Whittier in Illinois. Um, Julie gave me the phone number to call there. So at about 8.30 in the morning on the 8th of January, I did call and asked for uh, Perry Tarika. And I told him who I was. I told him where I worked. I said that this Julie Jensen had called us and that she didn't know what to do anymore. She was tired of getting hang-up calls. And I said, I'm not accusing you of doing it. If you have been doing it, just knock it off. And if you haven't been doing it, that's fine. And uh, he got real snappy on the phone. And he said, who are you with? What's your phone number? And then he said, well, listen here, mister. How dare you call and harass me? And I, I told him, not harassing you, I said. I just wanted to try to bring a closure to this because it had been going on for so long. And he said, I, I had an affair with her. I respected her wishes not to contact her anymore. I haven't had any contact with her. I'm not going to have any more contact with her. I'm not going to call her. And uh, he was pretty upset on the phone that I would have even called him to ask him about that. And, and what was what was your what was your response? Were you sort of apologetic to him? I just said, I I'm not here to accuse you of anything. I mean, if if it's been going on, fine. And if it's not, that's fine too. Because it was my hope that if it had been him making the phone calls, that perhaps it might cause him to stop calling. Did he specifically deny deny having called her? He denied calling her. He denied having any contact at all with her. Denied entirely that he had any contact or tried to contact her? Correct. Okay. Um, so was that, the, was that the end of your investigation? Well, Julie had gone out of town, I believe, the 10th through the 12th, and she'd asked for extra patrol on the house because of the lawn furniture. And when she got back, I was on duty, and she called the police department, and she was very upset. <clears throat> she said that when she returned from her vacation, her sister, Jill Griffin, who lives in Kenosha, had called her up and said, I want you to come over to the house. I believe she went over to the house, or if Jill went to their house, I can't recall. But anyway, Jill had received a letter, care of Julie Jensen, at um, Jill Griffin's house. And it was from Perry Tarika. And Julie had opened it. It was a uh, Christmas card. There was a rambling letter about uh, how much he cared for her, how much he loved her, um, wishing her and her new baby and her husband well. Um, there were some like cartoon clippings and some articles about love. And she was very upset by receiving the letter. And I looked at the postmark of the letter and it said January 6th of 1992. And right away, 
I thought to myself, I had talked to him on the 8th, and he was adamant that he had not called her, he had not had any contact with her, that he was not going to have any contact with her. When it was mailed on the 6th, he could have easily told me on the phone, hey, by the way, she's going to be receiving a letter in the mail from me that I just sent, and he didn't. Um, instead, he was uh, very defiant and very upset with me for having called and said that he had had no contact in any way, shape, or form with her. He had, even, he had basically gotten angry with you for suggesting that he might contact her. Correct. And then you, you look at this letter, and it was, it was postmarked just two days before your conversation with him? That's correct. Let me see if I can find an exhibit. Uh, Tarika. <laughs> Lieutenant Hunter, let me show you exhibit 201. And it is the first page of exhibit 201, is that the um, uh, a photocopy of the envelope that was received by Ms. Griffin? Yes. And actually, let me, let me just put that on the screen. Uh, sure. If you can identify it from there. Uh, Lieutenant, right, right behind you there. Um, so this is the envelope that was re received that was postmarked just two days before this conversation? Yes, sir. And uh, over here is the postmark that it said January 6th. That's correct. And the return address for Mr. Tarika is over in the left-hand corner. Yes. And uh, it's one of the enclosures, this Christmas card that's not photocopied particularly well. Yes. And then we have this uh, letter. Was this... Uh, this letter, part of what was received? Yes, sir, it is. And then, uh, is this the inside of that card that we, that we saw? Yes. Okay. And then you said there were some clippings and cartoons, right? Yes. This, this was all part of the same, same package? That's correct. And, uh, and some article that nice guys, were nice guys finish, right? Yes. Did this come as quite a surprise to you? Yes, it did. Uh, what was what was your response? How did you how did you handle this, uh, Lieutenant? Well, like I said, Ju uh, Julie was very upset that she had received this card, and she was even convinced more that maybe Perry had been involved in some um, of the calls. I told her that I would call him up and. Uh, she said, I want something done. I would like to seek a charge of harassment or something against him because she said, I just can't go on like this. So I called Perry and um, I can't um, recall the exact conversation that I had with, if I could see that report. Yeah, let me, let me give you your report, which is, uh, exhibit Exhibit 203. You wrote a report on January 13th, 1992? Yes. That would have been right after she had gotten back from vacation and had called. Uh, Perry Trika at his uh, workplace, and he said that he did send the letter to the care of her sister, and he said that he did not consider the letter to be harassment, and he kept saying that harassment would be calling her on the phone, but a letter would not be, and I talked to my chief, and he said that under our local ordinance of harassment, that um, to go ahead and issue him a citation, which I did, I mailed it to him. Um, he told me that he was still madly in love with uh, Julie and uh, that he just wanted to express her fe his feelings for her, which is why he wrote the letter. I mailed a citation to him for harassment. And I don't know whatever happened with the case for sure. I do know that after that 
particular time when the citation was mailed that Julie had never called me. I don't know if any other officers had responded, but I had not received any more. Now, when you spoke with Mr. Tarika, and it was a January 13th, <coughs> 1992 that you spoke with, spoke with him? The, uh, the 14th. The 14th. At, nine, at 9.30. Okay. Was it the 13th that Julia talked, spoken with you? I thought I saw the 13th. I believe it was the 13th. It was uh, whatever day she got back from. The 13th. And at, so 9 the at 9 a.m. is when she called me, and I called Perry that same day at 9.30. Okay. Now, you indicated that the first time you spoke with Mr. Tarika, um, you were pretty non-accusatory and just trying to find out what was going on. Yes. Had your tone changed when you called him, called him back? Yeah, I said, I can't believe this. I said, I... You, you, you were so mad at me for calling, you were adamant that you hadn't, and I said, and here's a letter, and he, his defense right away was, well, that's not harassment. Sending a letter is not harassment. And I told him that she doesn't want any more contact with you. And in the ph a phone call previous, on the 8th when I had talked to Perry Tarika, he had said that he had respected her wishes not to contact her. And so it was just pretty much a surprise. Okay. Now, uh, you mentioned that Mrs. Jensen, uh, when you'd first had contact with her, had said that she had had an affair with this individual? Yes. Do you recall what she had to say about that, that affair? She really didn't, um, that I recall, go into too much detail. She just said that it had happened a year before or a year and a half before, and then she said that she had broken it off with that and that she had told her husband about it and that they were working through that. Now, um, you mentioned something about trying to set up a trace through Wisconsin, Wisconsin Bell. Yes. They were the local telephone carrier at the time? Yes. Something that you had to, uh, were harassing phone calls something that was part of your job duties? in 1991 and 1992 that you occasionally had to investigate? Sure. And uh, uh, one of the methods by which you try to deal with harassing phone calls might be to put on a phone trace? Yes. And uh, did you learn during the course of your duties that uh, you couldn't trace calls to another state? Yes. Lieutenant Hunter, um, were, you also, were you also present at the, um, the Jensen household on the uh, the evening that uh, Mrs. Jensen passed away? Yes, I was. And what were your duties at the, what were your duties at the scene? I was called from home to come there to um, take photos. And did you in fact take photographs? Yes, of the interior of the home. Uh, any photographs that we have of the interior, those would have been taken by you, is that? Is that correct? Yes. Um, and did you did you make your own decisions as to what to photograph, or was that done at the direction of Detective Ratsberg or someone else? I was told to, uh, Lieutenant Ratsberg was there, and I was told to go in and just take photos of each room as as it was, and. Uh, that's, that's what I did, I just proceeded through the house. Do you know what time that you took the photographs? I don't, I know that I was called at home at about 5 p.m. So I'm thinking of 6.30ish, 7, I would have to double check what time I arrived at the house. Do you have any reports relating to um, your activities at the house that night? Um, yes, I do.
that uh, you have a, a two-page, a page and a half narrative of your activities at the scene? Yes, sir. And is there any indication in there as to precisely what time uh, <coughs> photographs were taken? No, I don't believe so. No, there isn't. And uh, is there any other document that you're aware of that would tell you when the photographs were taken? No. Now, I, I see from the um, from your report that uh, you seized a uh, a leather-bound uh, daytimer calendar of Mark Jensen's. Is that correct? And I'm looking at the second page of your narrative, your narrative report. Yeah, I, I don't know that I, I seized it. I saw the black leather bound day timer, and there are different notations on different dates inside of it. Okay. Um, I believe that Lieutenant Rasberg or Sergeant Riley would have collected it if they did collect it. Well, you reviewed that calendar, correct? I remember paging through it, and we were, I believe, in the home office area, and Lieutenant Ransberg was there, too. And did you identify that as an item that should be seized in your investigation of this case? Lieutenant Ransberg was in charge of the scene, and any decisions on what to take, um, I, I know that he took the computer and other things, so I, I don't know that... I personally said we need to take this, but I do remember that there were notations in it. Okay. Did you alert him to the, the notations and suggest that it might be important? I think, I, I can't remember if Sergeant Riley was standing next to me. We just more or less saw it there and, you know, thought that it might be important to the important to, to the case in somehow. I mean, we didn't really know at the time what had happened or um, or what value it may have, but. Okay, and this was an item then that you did, you did seize at the time? Yes. Okay. Lieutenant, I, uh, just to finish up here, I, I just, uh, you'd indicated you took photographs at, at the scene, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Just like you to identify a, a few photographs here. Um, do you this is uh, Exhibit 132. Do you recall taking Exhibit 132 at the at the scene? Yes. So, okay. I would I would move and this is of the computer room. Yes. And we can see the computer right over here. Correct. Correct. I would move Exhibit 132. No objection. It will be returned. You also took uh, a photograph of, this is exhibit, Defense Exhibit 171. That's correct. And do you recall if that was the Jensen bathroom uh, connected to the master bedroom? Yes. And we have some, some Dixie cups here on the counter. That's correct. Were you asked to seize those? I don't recall if those were seized or not. Okay. I move uh, Exhibit 171 if it hasn't been previously admitted. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Received. Show you uh, Exhibit 172, uh, Lieutenant Hunter, uh, and this is of the kitchen area in the Jensen household. Yes, sir. And all these pictures were taken on December 3rd, 1998. Correct. That's correct. Uh, and we have some various uh, glasses on the kitchen counter here. Yes. And do you know whether all those glasses were seized? That I don't recall. Okay. You don't recall if you did it, or you don't recall doing it. I I, I don't recall what if if I had like an evidence list, but I don't I don't recall actually being like the collector of any evidence. Okay. Have you had any role in the investigation of this case since December third, nineteen ninety eight? No. Let me let me just put on the screen. This is whoops. This is Exhibit um, 170. And do you recognize that as the, the bedside table in the, in the bedroom? Yes, I do. And uh, you see that there's a phone there uh, next to the bed? Yes. 
And do you recall whether uh, officers seized those, uh, those dish items there on the bedside table? I believe one bowl had macaroni and cheese or something in it, and they did um, seize that. Okay. Yeah. And that's exhibit 170, which I move in the event it hasn't already been received. No objection. You see? And here's a more close up view of the items on the bedside table the phone, uh, a blue glass, uh, some tissues, a, a moose <coughs> lamp, and uh, it looks like the macaroni and cheese uh, that you previously mentioned, correct? Correct. I would move uh, 169. No objection. Received. And I have two newly marked photographs here, exhibits 297 and 298. And I'll have you look at 298 first and invite your attention in particular to that, the lower left hand portion. Is this a, a picture again of the kitchen counter? At yes. the Jensen home? It looks like a dishwasher right there. Okay. Yes. And, and can you see what appears in the lower left-hand corner of 298, uh, what appears to be a, a, a Walgreens prescription envelope? Yes, sir. Okay. And then if you look at 297, does that appear to be a close-up of the Walgreens prescription envelope? Yes. And can you read the date and time on that prescription envelope? December 2, 1998, 11.13 a.m. At 11.13 a.m. on December 2nd. That's correct. And that, that was the day before uh, Mrs. Jensen's death? Correct. And I would move exhibits 297 and 298. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Proceed. Just one last thing I'll ask you about. Um, Well, do you know whether Pleasant Prairie has a, uh, a building inspector's office? Yes, they do. And uh, uh, they're, they're in charge of uh, issuing building permits? Yes. Are you familiar with the documents that are issued in regards to building permits? No. Um, I know if you want to get a fence or sometimes site or something, I'm not sure of all the, what, what it takes to get one. Okay, that, you don't have any authority for um, prosecuting those kind of, those kind of violations for a, a, a building code violation or a failure to get a permit or anything like that? No, the building inspector, just like the fire department, they do have the authority to issue citations if there was non-compliance with um, a, someone who got a, or okay. did not, or did something and did not get one. Okay. Well, we would not really have any authority or contact with. Okay. Um, I have here a certified copy of uh, documents relating to a building permit for a deck at the Jensen home in 1990, 1994, which I, I moved as a certified copy. Any no, objection? No objection. And, uh, I know you may not be familiar with this, but maybe you can help me out here. Uh, we see that there's a list of inspections uh, relating to this deck. Do you see that? Yes. And does it appear that there was a final inspection uh, of the deck indicating that it was finished? It says 10-394 pass. I don't know if that would, but it says final, yes. Okay, and it looks like it, it may even say, say pass. <laughs> Let me, let me put yes, that on the screen. Uh, first, we have a building permit for a deck for the pool uh, issued on July 8th, 1994. And then we have record of, in, record of inspections and down, down here where it says final October 3rd, 1994, and perhaps that says pass there, correct? Correct. Thank you, Lieutenant. Any uh, yes. a request for 
Cross, recross, whatever. Cross. <laughs> Your Honor, since it's noon, would this be a good time to stop? Since it was no, just it's a good time to stop. All right, folks. Is in the, we're going to go to uh, all the way to one thirty for your lunch today.
Christ for the dirty. We are uh, back on the record on Mark Jensen, 2002 CF 314. The appearances are the same. The jury's back in the courtroom for the afternoon portion of uh, today's trial. We're watching the uh, interview of Mark Hunter. I believe it's Exhibit 104. I know we're at least halfway through it, so we can continue with it, Ms. Krause. I will, Judge. It looks like over break my computer reset, so... I'm just trying to find the right spot. I'm showing exhibit. Can we go back a little bit? And we started at 3014. <laughs> Lieutenant Hunter, you were um, showing exhibit 201. Do you still have that up there? I have 203, 295, and 296. Okay. Did you put 201 back? Oh. 201. It's the letter for Perry Tarika. No, it's the letter. She says no. he didn't give it back. I saw it. Is it letter? Um, exhibit 201, it's the letter from Perry Tarika. Yeah, here you go. Thanks. Sorry about that. Okay. You identified exhibit 201 as um, the letter that was given to you by Julie Jensen from Perry Tarika? That's correct. Um, and on the first page of that exhibit, is that the, a photocopy of the envelope that the letter was sent in? Yes, it is. Is there a return address on that envelope? Yes, there is. And what's the, what does the return address section say? P. Tarika, 7309 North Nora, Niles, Illinois, 606 -48. And this was sent U.S. mail? Yes. Um, did any of the other harassing material that Mrs. Jensen had received up to this point have any return addresses listed on the envelopes? No, not that I'm aware of. In looking through Exhibit 201, the letter from Mr. Chirica, are there any sexually explicit photographs contained in there? No. Um, are there any references in writing to sexual acts or positions? No. Is there anything obscene about that letter? No, nothing obscene. And sending one letter to a person you previously had a relationship isn't really harassment, is it? Well, objection. It resulted in a ticket, so I think. Well, I, 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 the, uh, who would be in a better position to know than the person who uh, issued it? The objection's overruled. Yes, she, um, state law harassment or local ordinance. I mean, there's a lot of, in our, in villages and cities, they may not be tied to just state charges like, say, a sheriff's department or what. And even then there's some, like, there's a local ordinance that says obedience to officer, which I don't even know what that means. I suppose if I told someone to sit down and they wouldn't sit down, I could write them for obedience to an officer. Um, foul language, there's an ordinance that says foul language, so if I heard someone swearing, I suppose I could write them a ticket for, does it rise to a state level charge? No, but our harassment under a local ordinance, at least at that time, didn't get into a pattern or course of conduct. Um, and when I had talked to my chief and he said that she had received this letter, he suggested that I issue him for harassment, which is not, may not rise to the level of, say, a state charge, but like I said, the local police departments have other ordinances that, um, that may not be a, a state charge, but they're there for us to, to use. So I don't know if that answers your question. It, it certainly was, in her mind, when I talked to her harassment, she was just 
very upset that she had received the letter. And at the time that she received this letter, she thought Mr. Tarika was responsible for ever, all the other harassment that had been occurring up to that point also. I wasn't sure if all of the harassment that had been taking place. I mean, she didn't say to me, I think he's the one then that moved the lawn furniture or, but she, in asking me the first time to call him about the phone calls, that's the, what she had told me was that she, the only person that she could think of who was making the calls was him. And so I know when she got the letter, she was really upset, but that's okay. all that I recall about. Okay. Well, I guess what I'm get asking you is, if there had been no other sexually explicit photographs being left, no hang-ups, no furniture <coughs> being moved around, and all you had was this one letter, is that something you would normally issue a citation for? I may have called him up and, and warned him, but I think that because he had called, when I, in the conversation just two days before, he had said that he has not called her, has had no contact, has had planned to have no contact with her. Um, I think that's what, and at, at the time, it certainly fell within, maybe not a state charge, but the, our local uh, ordinances that we have. Um, now, you were shown, I believe, a police report from August of 1991 that you wrote. Do you have that up there? Yes. Okay. What exhibit number is that? Um, 295. At the time that you had this conversation with Mrs. Jensen in August of 1991, um, did you ask Mrs. Je did Mrs. Jensen tell you? Well, let me rephrase that. Did Mrs. Jensen tell you that she and her husband had been receiving pornographic letters in the mail in obscene and harassing phone calls at home? Yes. And then did you ask to see some of the letters? Yes, and I would have to read through here, but I believe she told me that they had disposed of them or they didn't have them. And anymore. do you recall why you asked to see some of the letters? Well, if we could get a letter, there's a possibility that we could ninhydrin nin spray it and get a fingerprint off of it, or um, if there had been, I didn't know if there had been any handwriting in it, possibly we could have tried to do something with that. Okay. So at the, did you tell Mrs. Jensen that you wanted to see some of the letters so that you could try to lift some fingerprints off of them? Yes. Okay. Did you check back with Mrs. Jensen um, a few days later to ask her if there had been any more harassing behavior and she said no? Just reading it on Wednesday, 8 28, 91 at 1 p.m. I called Julie Jensen at home and she said that it was kind of spoiled. Okay. Yes, she said that she has had no more calls and will let us know if she does. Okay. Did you also then, you, you spoke with Mrs. Jensen again in January of 1992, correct? Yes. And this is approximately five months after this last conversation where you um, asked her about any letters so that you could lift fingerprints? Yes. And at that time, did Mrs. Jensen tell you that her husband was receiving harassing, harassing letters at work? That's what she said that she had received at home and her husband would receive at his workplace. She, in referring to harassing or obscene letters, correct? Harassing phone calls. Okay. Did she also tell you that her husband had thrown away the obscene letters that he had received at work? Yes. Okay. Next sentence down, I do see that. Yes. So as a result, there was nothing, she had nothing to give you in order to try to get fingerprints off of them? Correct. And that's because her husband was throwing them away? Correct.
nothing further. <laughs> Lieutenant, Lieutenant Hunter, um, inviting your attention uh, back to the um, your report of August 26, 1991. Could you give me the exhibit number on, on that letter, please? 296. Thank you. Sure. Um, exhibit 296, and I'd, I'd invite your attention to, um, oh, it's about seven lines from the bottom, a sentence that begins, I asked. You see that sentence that begins with I asked at the end of the line? Is that on page one or page? Uh, page yeah, th thank you. It is on page. It is on page one, about seven lines from the bottom, and it's the last two words of the line. It begins with "I asked." Oh yes, I see it. Okay, and uh, what your what your report indicates is that you asked to see some of the letters, so that uh, is that Lieutenant Wagner Correct. could try to lift a fingerprint, uh, and she said, and she referring to Mrs. Jensen. Is that right? That's correct. She said that she had thrown the letters away. Is that right? That's correct. And you thought it would make sense to uh, get a, a fingerprint from these documents, correct? Correct. And were you aware from your um, contacts in the department that there was some continuing problems that the Jensen's had with receiving uh, harassing material after your contacts with them ceased? Yes. And were you aware of whether they ever tried to get a fingerprint from this material? Then I'm not sure. I, I just know that at roll call, we share information about cases. So I'm not sure what was going on with every aspect of, of those things. But I, I was aware that it was a continued um, problem. OK. And, and was that mostly through Officer Cosman? Do you recall? I, I, I believe Officer Cosman. And I, I can't remember if anyone else had okay. mentioned going down there. And at this time, do you recall whether uh, Officer Cosman ever indicated that <laughs> materials actually were turned turned over, that photographs were turned over to uh, the police by the Jensen's? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I never saw any. And are you saying you don't think that happened or that you just don't recall anything like that at I just don't call? recall being aware that anything had been collected from the house. Okay. But uh, based on what you did in 1991, uh, you would have believed that good police work would have been to get some fingerprints from these kind of materials. Or handwriting, if there was any handwriting on there to match it or compare it, yes. <clears throat> on August, it looks like the August 26th incident was sort of wrapped up by you, um, if you go to page two, uh, it was just two days later on August 28th that you called back and, and provided Mrs. Jensen with the information. Well, she told you that Wisconsin Bell could not uh, trace calls in another state. Correct. And, all, and she simply told you at that time that between August 26th and August 28th, they hadn't received any calls. Is that accurate? That's, that's correct. And uh, during your experience, you've had other occasion to investigate, uh, I guess, contacts of a harassing nature? Yes. And uh, in some instances, does the harasser try different, different methods that is sometimes being nice and sometimes uh, being mean? Yes. I mean, there, there's an attempt to win back the person and at the same time to uh, uh, do bad things to the person to punish them for not coming back. Yes, in fact, I've investigated a number of stalking type cases and it is that. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant. Any question? No, Your Honor. Mr. Tuck. Thank you. So, Judge, I would move in Exhibit 106, which was previously 203, 108, which was previously 296, 105, which was previously 295, and 107, which was previously 299. All right, they will be received. And then, Judge, I would like to show um, the two photos that were shown to the jury, and I've, they're on Exhibit... 104, 104, item 5, and item 6. All right, go ahead. 
And this is item six. And I would move those in with exhibit 104. They will be received. Who does the defense wish to call next? Dr. Richard Borman. All right. Number four on the defendant's amended witness list. If you could remain standing, doctor, raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. You solemnly swear the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Try to get as close as you can to the microphone, and then spell your first and last name for the reporter. <clears throat> uh, Richard Borman. Richard J. Borman, B-O-R-M-A-N. Who's asking the questions? I am judge. Go ahead. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Dr. Borman. I'm going to ask you a little bit about your employment or past employment. Okay. Um, can you tell us how you are employed or were employed? I've been retired since 2010, and I was, um, the last thing I did, I was uh, employed by Kenosha Hospital Medical Group for about the last year of my practice. Um, uh, when, I, when I was taking care of the Jensen's, I was in private uh, solo practice. And were you licensed in the state of Wisconsin? Yes. And what was the nature of your private practice? Family practice. So I did everything from taking care of babies to old people and hospital and office and assisted at surgery, a lot of things like that. And how long did you do that? So I uh, graduated medical school in 79 and finished my residency in 82. Uh, finished my Air Force time in 86. Um, I've been in Kenosha s since uh, 89. Uh, I ran a residency program that was based out at Parkside. And then I was in uh, my own private practice from 93 until 2009, and then worked for the hospital group for the last year, retiring in 2010. And were you board certified as a family practice doctor? Yes. Have you ever done any teaching in your career? Yes, yeah. And what was that? Um, a fair amount, actually. So um, after my residency from uh, 82 to 86, in the Air Force, I was on a, a faculty of a family practice residency program and taught residents, medical students, and uh, PA students. Then I came after my uh, military service up to Milwaukee, and from 86 to uh, 89, I was on the faculty at St. Mary's Hospital up in Milwaukee. Then I came down here in 89 and took over the directorship of the residency program where I did the same thing, teaching residents and medical students as well as uh, private practice. Then from 93 on, I was in uh, solo private practice. And I think you said it was when you were in your solo private practice that you treated the Jensen's? Correct. <clears throat> I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibit number 99. Dr. Borman, do you recognize that document? Yes. Um, and can you tell the jurors what that is? This is a portion of my medical record on Julie Jensen. And was that kept in the regular course of your medical clinic business? Yes. I'm going to ask you 
a little bit about, if you remember, how Julie Jensen became a patient of yours. Right. So um, when I uh, went into my private practice, um, part of what I did is uh, assume the practice of Dr. Fred Wood, who was uh, an internist in town uh, for many years, and he took care of the family before I did. And um, so I, as part of my practice, I took over his patients, many of his patients, and uh, hired his staff. I also brought um, my own patients from my previous practice out at Parkside as well. And did you treat anyone else in the Jensen family? Everybody. Mark and the boys and parents and, yes. So you were their family doctor? Right. Now I want to talk to you just briefly about whether you treated David Jensen. I did. And you had testified that you had also treated Douglas Jensen. Right. And were Julie and Mark Jensen and the boys patients of yours through December of 1998? Yes, they were. And did Mark Jensen and the boys continue to see you after Ms. Jensen's passing? For a while, yeah. I think um, they transferred in about 2000. Based upon your experience with the Jensen family, can you tell us who handled like the medical issues with the Jensen family, if you remember? Well, um, <clears throat> sometimes Julie would call for Mark. Occasionally Mark would call for Julie. Um, they'd make each other's appointments. Um, Julie would call and uh, have uh, prescriptions refilled, that sort of thing, time to time. Um, would she also make appointments for the boys? Yes. And was she the primary person that brought the boys to your office prior to January of 1999? Um, yeah, it's been a while, but I think so. Now, can you, can you tell us if you remember in 1997 to 1998 whether David Jensen had some health problems? Yeah, he had a, he had a kind of recurring cough, which... Um, uh, was um, kind of a kind of a nuisance, and it sort of defied diagnosis, and it seemed to be a tick, of some sort. And um, yeah, I saw him several times for that, and and actually sought some uh, reinforcement from the specialist at Children's Hospital. Do you remember when you started seeing David Jensen? What year it was for these coughing or this ticks? I don't. If you look at the document in front of you which I marked, what exhibit did I tell you, sir? 99. 99. And you look at that September yes. mm -hmm. of 97. Can you tell in your notes, which I cannot read, um, whether you spoke about David Jensen at uh, Miss <coughs> Jensen's interim physical? <clears throat> Let's see. I didn't really say anything about his uh, health at that point. At some point, you started to see David Jensen for these ticks or this cough? Um, I don't have those records in front of me, but I did see him on several occasions, yeah. And you were trying to figure out what was going on with him, is that fair to say? Right. At first you thought it could be like Tourette's? Objection, counsel's a leading witness. Why don't you just rephrase it? At first did you consider um, anything that could be causing like the coughing and the ticks? Well, you know, the usual things, uh, you know, cold, um, sinus, reflux, something like that, reactive airway disease. And did you send him to um, specialists, or were consult did you have him sent to other doctors to see or rule out any of those things? Again, I don't have the records. I, we talked about that. I don't, I don't know that um, the appointments were ever made. I suggested a couple of options, and they were thinking about it. If I showed you your testimony from 2008, would that help refresh your memory? Sure. Page nine. <clears throat> No, 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 you're on the right. I'm going to show you this document and ask you to 
read from page 9, starting on line 19. Through the next page, line 9, and let me know if that refreshes your memory. Sure. Right, so I, I guess I did send them to an ear, nose, and throat specialist and an allergist as well. Do you remember at any point um, sending up a neurology appointment for Mr. David Jensen? We talked about that, but I don't know that that happened. Um, at some point after December of 1998, did you continue to treat David Jensen? He was still in the practice. I, I don't know if I saw him, but I did hear that his cough uh, went away. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about the treatment records that are in front of you as it relates to Julie Jensen. Um, and these are the records, I think, of the last four pages of her treatment file. Would that be fair to say mid-1997 to December of 1998? Right. Oh, I've lost a page. I'm going to actually ask you to begin with page three, I believe it is, and it's the September 21st, 1998 notation, if you see that. And can you tell from your notes what that visit was with Ms. Jensen? I'm sorry? Can you tell from your notes what the purpose of that visit was? Right. So that was an interval exam and uh, annual physical. And what do you mean by interval exam and annual physical? So the adults in my practice, we'd like to see at least once a year um, to kind of pull everything together, what kind of interval history they'd had emphasize some of the uh, preventive medicine things and uh, take care of whatever problems might need to be handled. And can you tell us what her weight was by your records? Yeah, one, 123 and a half. And her uh, height? 5'6". Does it indicate whether she had any allergies? Uh, none known. And whether she was taking any medications on September 21st of 1998? Uh, multiple vitamins, calcium, and, and clearasil topically. Um, when you look at your notes over on the side, does it indicate what you discussed with Ms. Jensen at this interval exam? Uh, yes. And can you tell us what some of those notes say? So uh, we talked about David's ticks, and I put that in quotes because it was still kind of undetermined. And that was on that September 21st visit? That was the first thing we talked about. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had talked about her family history of depression. Do you know why you talked about Miss Jensen's family history of depression? <coughs> I don't remember the details at this point. Okay. Next thing. Yeah, um, we talked about she'd had a tubal ligation from Dr. Snyder and that her mens period had been regular, and that she seemed to have a little bit of premenstrual uh, syndrome at present. All right, and then um, is there a part where you talk about past family and social history? Yeah, um, she was volunteering at school. At home was Mark and the two boys. Uh, no smoking, occasional alcohol. She'd had concerns because her mom was alcoholic and she was especially um, careful. She didn't want to proceed down that path. And that's something she discussed with you on that September 21st? Yes. Okay. Uh, admitted to about a cup of coffee a day and no other uh, drug use. <clears throat> Did she mention whether she was tired? Um, yeah. Uh, what does that say? Right. So she was tired, and um, in the past she'd had some, an episode of depression and taken Prozac for a time. 
And did she make any indication about the being tired as it related to that past treatment? I don't remember that. Okay. And then what is your next note? Um, she wore, wore reading glasses, hearing is okay, up to date with the dentist. Then I mentioned that her father had died of lung cancer in his 70s. And at some point, did you start talking um, with Ms. Jensen about depression? Um, again, I don't remember. Uh, there were other elements of our visit. I, I did an exam. We talked about some other uh, health maintenance type things. Is there a reason why the discussion of Prozac and prior counseling would have come up? Um, yeah, we were talking about her family history of depression. I guess I asked her if, I don't remember, if she'd had a, pr a previous history. And do you remember if you felt that she was depressed on September 21st of 1998? Objection, counsel's leading the witness. Rephrase it. I didn't imply the answer. I asked if he... Can you just rephrase I'll it? Try, we'll Judge. move on. I'll try. Thank you. Um, At, and at the end of the visit, did you have an opinion as to whether Ms. Jensen was depressed? Yeah, I, one of the diagnoses was mild depression, and I put down counsel. We, we talked. With her previous history, she was tired. She was definitely stressed and concerned about David's tics, and then having what I thought was some uh, premenstrual uh, symptoms and maybe perimenopause uh, stuff. Um, we talked about all of that. So I think you said it said something about, um, did you say depressed and counseled? Right. I, that was a, a diagnosis, mild depression, and then I uh, counseled. We, we had discussed that. So when you say counseled, are you saying that you referred her to counseling or you counseled her? I, I did it at that point. And is that something you generally did with your patients in general practice? Frequently. Did you have any training as it related to um, counseling someone for mild depression? That, that's part of family medicine uh, training. That was part of my residency and lots of experience uh, over the years. Um, in, in the kind of practice that I, I did, people would often have uh, psychological issues that they would bring. And, and oftentimes they'd be an oh, by the way, kind of going out the door, and it turned out that was the most important part of the visit. So, yeah, considerable experience. And as it related to Ms. Jensen, you counseled her on that day as it related to the mild depression? Yes. The next note on Ms. Jensen's record, I think, is from September 25th of 1998. Yes. And can you tell us what that is for? So that was a phone call, and she wanted a, a refill on Cataflam, which is an anti-inflammatory, um, and we were changing it to a different pharmacy. Uh, Does it say what um, the change in pharmacy was? Pardon me? Does it say what the change in pharmacy was? Right, so from, uh, let's see, it was done at Walgreens in August, then she wanted it at good value, and so we called it into the good value uh, pharmacy. And doctor, would it be fair to say that the next couple of um, entries in Ms. Jensen's patient file have to do with this medication? Correct. This cataflam and the generics? Right, and, and then uh, as happens oftentimes, so insurance coverage, we needed to change it to a different medicine, which we did, and then um, I think it eventually got filled. And uh, I think she took that for headaches from time to time. I'm gonna take you to the next page and refer you to the notes on December 1st, 1998. Right. Um, can you tell me um, what this visit was for? Yeah. This one, uh, it's on Tuesday, December 1st, uh, 1998, and it was at the end of the morning. We worked her in, um, it seemed like she needed to be seen, and uh, you want me to go through my note here? Not quite yet, but I will. Hmm? Um, do you remember if she was with anyone when she came to see you? I think she was alone. And then on your note, can you tell us what the first part of the note reads? Right. She was miserable and depressed and uh, decreased appetite, having some diarrhea, 
talking about marital problems. She uh, specifically denied being suicidal or homicidal and, and denied any domestic violence that anybody was doing to her. And again, we uh, discussed her strong family history and then her past history of uh, Prozac and some counseling. So I want to break that down a little bit for you. On the left-hand side, there are also notes as it relates to Ms. Jensen, right? Pardon me? On the left-hand side, probably in a little bit better penmanship, there are some notes relating to Ms. Jensen. Right. And that's the December 1st, 98 um, right. office visit, correct? You just translated some of my, uh, my writing, but yeah. And um, what does the first part of that say? I think I just said it, but uh, Ms. No, I mean the the part that you can read a little bit better. Oh, it, the reason she was there was discuss a personal matter. And then it, did it have her weight at that point? Yes, 115, which and is eight and a half pounds less than she was uh, three months ago. Does it also talk about allergies? Still said none known. And what about medications at that point? None. So then we went into your handwriting, which you read to us, um, and you said that... was my that, nurse's handwriting, by the way. Excellent. Very, very good. Yep. And in your handwriting, can you read to us again what it said? Right. Just the first couple of lines, please. Right. I, I remember that clearly. She was miserable, depressed, um, decreased appetite and some diarrhea, and then uh, concerned about marital problems, not suicidal or homicidal, denied any domestic violence, and then we talked about the strong family history of depression and her previous history with uh, Prozac for a time. When you wrote down that she was miserable and depressed, do you know if that's what she said to you, or is that what you, that was your impression? Probably a little of both. And when she talked about decreased appetite, is that something that she said to you? I probably uh, uh, elicited that by asking her. Uh, questions. And did you ask her questions because of the miserable well, I noticed depressed? Right. I noticed her weight was down. That's concerning. That, that, that amount, she was thin to begin with. And, I mean, she looked depressed. And those are some of the things that we talk about with depression. And so I was kind of covering some of those bases just to kind of flesh, flesh things out a bit. So you were, were you trying to find out what potential symptoms there could be? Right. And one of those was decreased appetite that she told you? Yes. Now, you said that you wrote a note of marital problems. Do you remember what she told you? That I don't. If I showed you your testimony from 2008, do you think that would refresh your recollection? Sure. <clears throat> what page, Council? 25. Thank you. So what page was it? Doctor, I'm going to ask you to review 15 through 17 and then 20 through 25 and let me know if that refreshes your recollection. <clears throat> Yes. Did she describe what she meant by marital problems? Right, that uh, she'd had a brief affair in the past and um, that Mark had never really forgiven her for that. She was worried that she was losing her marriage and uh, her kids meant everything to her. And did she tell you she didn't want to lose her kids? Yes. Now, you also testified that you asked about domestic violence. Yes. And when you say domestic violence, what specifically do you explain to your patient as to what domestic violence means? Well, a lot of different uh, um, areas in that. But uh, in particular, she didn't mention anything about worried that somebody was trying to kill her, that, that there was any physical violence that they were uh, any, anybody, uh, you know, keeping her hostage in the house, uh, taking her money, anything like that. So when you say taking her money, is that like financial domestic violence? Right. And she didn't say anything about that? Nothing. 
And why do you talk to women who appear to be depressed about domestic violence? Pardon me? Um, is there a reason that you talk to women who appear to be depressed about domestic violence? Sure. It's, it's a common problem, unfortunately. And a lot of times um, it's not something that the lady might bring up spontaneously especially when there's some emotional or psychological issue that that has to be something that you think about. At some point, um, did you discuss medication with Ms. Jensen? Yes. And what was decided at that point? So, so I talked with her. She, she was uh, distraught. She was in tears. Um, uh, and, and uh, we discussed uh, some options and, and thought that at least a short-term uh, go with an antidepressant would be uh, indicated. I had, uh, back when we had sample closets, I had some Paxil in the closet and I gave her several and tried to refer her for counseling uh, set it, and uh, encourage her to come back and see me in two weeks, if not sooner. Uh, and, and we tried to help her set up an appointment, but she decided not to do that at that, uh, at that time. So, Doctor, in 1990, did you see a stigma with someone being diagnosed with mental health issues? I did mention that, and, and I think that's still the case. Um, uh, there's a, a shortage, really, of mental health professionals, and a lot of the mental health is done by primary care providers, physicians, family practice. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, sometimes it's, it's difficult to get in. Person happens to be in my office, it's something that we can do right then and there. Versus, you know, if I had just said, okay, well, we're gonna send you to see a psychiatrist, maybe it's a month, six weeks later before they get in. So we address that and start the, what I thought was appropriate treatment right then. And you, I think, testified that you referred her for counseling? suggested that she do that and we were going to help her make an appointment but she declined at, at that time. Um, did you ask her to come back and see you at some point? Two weeks. And did she schedule an appointment when she left that you know? I don't know. Is there any note about an uh, appointment on your? No. You know, I'll specifically say though, she she didn't act drunk at the time that I saw her. She was she was tearful, but she was uh, clear and uh, and appropriate. She didn't appear to be intoxicated. Not at is all. What you're saying? Okay. Um, you said that you asked her if she was suicidal or homicidal. Yes. And what was her response? No. Definitely um, not. I mean, she, she loved her boys, and there, she would do nothing to hurt them, and uh, they meant everything to her. And as someone who had practiced and also counseled in mental illness um, cases, is it fair to say that suicides are hard to predict? Correct. And would it also be fair to say that um, suicides bring somewhat of a stigma to an individual? For sure. Could someone be hospitalized if they were suicidal? Oftentimes, yep. Could someone be committed to like a mental health institution if they were suicidal? Objection, these are irrelevant hypothetical questions. We'll let you ask the last question the last and one. we'll go to the next area. Thank you, Judge. Um, could someone be um, committed in a mental health hospital if they were suicidal? Can, yeah. Th there's an emergency commitment procedure to give at least uh, 72 hours to sort that out. The other thing that you talked about when you were going through your treatment notes is a strong family history. Um, is that something you talked to her about? Yeah, but I don't remember the details on that one either. Is there anything in your notes besides strong family history? Actually, um, I think in the previous note, her mother had uh, problems with alcohol and uh, had a tragic death. Um, I don't remember other details. If I showed you your prior testimony, would that help refresh your memory? Sure. Page 30. The witness has already testified in manner precisely consistent with what's contained in Are this. Are you trying to refresh his recollection? 
Go ahead. Your Honor, the, 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 his already testified exactly the same way what's set here. He doesn't need his memory reflex. I don't know. I, I don't have the transcript in front of me, but mm -hmm. let's let's see if it helps him. I'm going to ask you to review from line 15 through line 18. Doctor, does that help refresh your recollection as to what Ms. Jensen and you talked about as it related to strong family history? It does. And what um, did she tell you? She was concerned about her mom's uh, course, and she didn't want to go down that same path um, and didn't want to be labeled as crazy uh, and didn't want to lose her kids. And that's something she discussed with you? Yes. Now, the next part of your notes, um, I think, is considered maybe the objective part, what you see from Ms. Jensen. Do you say that in your notes? Oh. I'm sorry. Do you see in your notes where it says O oh, and it's the objective part of your notes? Objection. Counsel's leading the witness. Yeah, I do. Ask the next question. Go ahead. And can you tell us if there's any notes there about what you saw as related to Ms. Jensen versus what she told you? Right. She was in tears. And then I put down we counseled for 15 plus minutes. Did you see her crying? Yes. Now, you had been treating Ms. Jensen for a number of years? Yes. Had you ever seen her in this state before? Never. And can you tell this jury how you would describe her demeanor on December 1st? Um, she looked depressed and distraught. We talked about what your plan was for her already, so I'm going to skip past that. And what was your diagnosis of Ms. Jensen on December 1st of 1998? <clears throat> Depression, anxiety, and marital problems. I'm going to take you to your next note, which is December 2nd of 1998. Do you see that there? I do. <coughs> um, can you tell us what happened on December 2nd of 1998? Right. So that was the next day after I'd seen Julie and given her a, a few um, samples of Paxil. Mark appeared at the window of my office about the same time of day, and he was concerned. He'd had some information from the Internet about side effects from Paxil. Objection. Objection. This calls for hearsay. Sustain. Judge, it's 908-03 sub 6, which we discussed previously. It's a business record exception. Coming in for that exception. Let's go. Thank you. Um, can you finish what you were saying, doctor, as to the note from December 2nd? Yeah, he was concerned that uh, Julie was not sleeping, and um, we asked she still hadn't set up any counseling, thought that if she could get some sleep, she might feel better. So I gave him a prescription for her of a few Ambien and strongly reinforced the follow-up either with me or a psychiatrist, psychologist, and that uh, to the emergency room if worse, and then suggested that they reduce the Paxil by half for a few days. Um, did he talk to you about, you, I think you were saying something about side effects of her taking the Paxil. Did he describe that to you? Well, I think he was concerned about her, she wasn't sleeping, mm -hmm. and thought that if she got a little sleep, she might feel better. I want to take you back just a couple of other entries as are related to Miss Jensen. Um, on the first page, there's an entry from June 19th of 1998. It should be the first page of Exhibit 99 at the bottom, June right. 19th, 1998. Okay. And can you tell us what that note is about? Phone call, um, had a sinus headache, wheezy, chest congestion, no fever. She was seen in the ER on the 14th of June, diagnosed with a sinus infection, bronchitis. They gave her a Z-Pack. She finished it, and she was taking some Duravent. And I uh, 
uh, thought she had some reactive airway disease and gave her a prescription for a Medrol dose pack and a Max Air inhaler, so some anti-inflammatories and a bronchodilator. Um, and was that prescription based upon you seeing her or just a conversation you had with her? If Actually, you um, I discussed that with my staff. She called, talked to one of my staff, and then I saw the note, and that's what I suggested they do, and then they called in that prescription. So I didn't actually talk to her about that one. The next entry on the next page is June 22nd of 1998 at, it looks like, 9.30? Right. And can you tell us what that contact with Ms. Jensen was? So that was another phone call, and she called about David that time. His cough uh, had recurred. The last one had lasted three months, and uh, he was well, and then now with the same problem. And... Um, in, my staff recommended either the Aurora walk-in clinic or the emergency room if necessary. And of course, I'd be happy to see him and follow up. And then um, the next visit, it looks like, was August 12th of 1998. Right. Another phone call. And that one was from Julie and question about bronchitis. She was coughing for a week. Green stuff coming up now. Using the Max Air and the, o and the OTC expectorant. Coughing uh, problem at night, chest tightness, throat dry, and I gave her a Z pack, which is an antibiotic, and then suggested either um, an appointment with me or emergency room, depending on how she did. Do you know if she ended up going to the emergency room after that? Um, I don't have a record of that. And then we already talked about the ones on the next page. Um, Dr. Borman, when you look at these last four pages of your visits with Ms. Jensen, do you see any visits from November of 1998? <clears throat> um, uh, no. Um, did you receive any calls from Ms. Jensen in November of 1998 about any illness? Uh, no. Illness? No, I didn't. And, Doctor, the last note as it relates to Ms. Jensen's medical record sorry, I've lost, is from December 7th of 1998. Is that right, the last That's page? Right. And that wasn't a meeting with Ms. Jensen. She had passed away by then. Is that fair to say? That's correct. And can you just tell us who that was with? Right. Uh, so... Uh, that was a phone call with uh, Roger Johnson, the medical examiner. And uh, I don't remember if I called him or he called me, but that was um, after her death. We discussed her untimely death, and uh, he, su he said that the, the toxicology and tissue tests were pending. The initial autopsy was unrevealing. I told him I was a little curious. I was not notified or questioned. I found out about her death by reading her obituary in the paper on uh, Saturday, the 5th of December. Again, I'd seen her the first, Mark was there on the second, and I didn't see anything until uh, the obit in the paper on the 5th. Um, I uh, paid my respects at the funeral home and saw, saw Mark there. He had said that uh, she wouldn't get out of bed her breathing seemed heavy, then changed and possibly congested. She repeatedly claimed to uh, be okay and declined any medical care, either with me or the emergency room. And then he returned home at some point and found her dead. She had not taken extra pills. That was my first concern that she took all my pills. Even if she had, that wasn't enough to uh, do her in. And then the medical examiner said he'll call if they needed any further information or whether, when the results were available. After you spoke to the medical examiner, did you speak to anyone in law enforcement? Um, subsequent to that, I did. Yeah. Would that have been January 14th of 1999? Sergeant Rasper Rasberg, yeah. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 98. Dr. Borman, do you recognize that document? I do. And is that a letter written by Detective Ratzberg or written by you? By me, to uh, Detective Ratzberg. Is it on your clinic letterhead? It is. And in that um, 
letter, did you write about your observations and your meetings with the Jensen's on December 1st and December 2nd? I did. I summarized uh, the visits that we had talked about and those last couple of uh, interactions that I had. Um, did you also um, talk about your meeting with Roger Johnson or your telephone call with Roger Johnson? I did. And did you also write in there about your appointment with Mark and the boys on December 14th? I did. <clears throat> yep. So I'm going to go back to your treatment of the Jensen's. Um, do you remember Ms. Jensen contacting your office to talk about any medical issues as it related to Mark Jensen? I reviewed my notes, and there were a series of phone calls over the years where she'd call for either an appointment or a prescription refill. And do you remember what prescriptions Mr. Jensen had in the fall of 1998? Not offhand. If I showed you a copy of your previous testimony, would that refresh your recollection? Yes. Right, so okay, so um, we'd called in a prescription for Zyban for smoking cessation for Mark, and then Nicotrol, which is another nicotine replacement. Doctor, do you know if Zyban is used for anything other than to help someone stop smoking? It's an antidepressant. Um, you had testified that you had gone to Julie Jensen's wake. I did. And you had had a conversation with Mr. Jensen? I did. Did he seem appropriately upset to you? He did. Dr. Borman, when you saw Ms. Jensen either in September or November, I'm sorry, September or December of 1998, <clears throat> did at any point she tell you that she was afraid of her husband? Never. Did she mention that her decrease in appetite was because she wasn't drinking or eating anything her husband gave to her? Didn't. Did she mention anything about being afraid of being poisoned? Did not. Thank you, Doctor. I don't have any other questions. I take it, Mr. Jamboys, you're doing the cross? I am, Your Honor. Go ahead. So, Dr. Borman, um, when Julie Jensen spoke to you on December 1st, 1998, she didn't tell you that she had seen uh, that her husband was looking up things on the Internet about how to kill her? Did not. She didn't mention that she'd seen all these poisoning sites? Did not. She didn't tell you that she thought her husband had previously tried to poison her? No. She didn't tell you that her husband repeatedly was pushing her to go see a doctor, did she? No, she didn't. And you have no idea as to why Mr. Jensen would be seeking to get his, doc his wife to go see a doctor, did you? No. Um, would it surprise you to learn that, um, well, within three days of Julie seeing you, she was dead, right? That surprised me a lot, yeah. And... Um, so if Mark Jensen was trying to get his wife to drink things and she was resistant to doing so, would one way possibly to get her to consume something would be to have her doctor prescribe medication for her? 
I don't understand that question. Oh, okay, well, if Mark Jentz was trying to get Julie to say drink wine or drink juice and she was refusing and she was refusing to do it, let's assume from what that happened before December 1st, 1998. He was trying to get her to drink something and she wouldn't do it. Can you assume from what that, that, that happened? We didn't discuss that. Okay. Now, if Mark Jensen, however, was having that problem, getting her to drink juice, do you think that one way maybe he could get her to drink some juice is to have her take some medication from the doc, prescribed by the doctor, and then drink some juice to get, to get the, the medication down? Would that be one way to get her to possibly drink something that she otherwise would not consume? So he's asking me for an opinion? Yes, I'm asking yes. you for an opinion. You can face the attorney. If there's an objection, we'll let you know, okay? Okay. Did you understand the question, sir? I hadn't thought about that. Well, would it surprise you to learn that Mark Jensen had thought about that? Objection, judge, speculation. No, there's actually evidence of it, Your Honor. The jury's heard evidence of it. Ask the question. Okay, would it, would it surprise you to hear, uh, to know, that this jury has heard evidence that Mark Jensen thought that one way to get his wife to drink the stuff he was trying to get her, to get her to drink, would be to get her to go to the doctor? Would it surprise you to hear that? Yes. Would it surprise you to hear that the reason that Mark Jensen went to see you on December 2nd was to get medication to get Julie to sleep. That, I mean, you, you were heard that. That's what that's, Mark told you, right? That's why I thought he was there, yeah. In fact, you indicated he was concerned that she was not sleeping. Correct. That's what he told you. But at the time that he told you that, <clears throat> you were looking at that from the perspective of a family physician, correct? Correct. And in your experience as a family physician, when a husband comes to tell you, I'm worried that my wife is not sleeping, you infer from that that the husband is actually has his, best, his wife's best interest at heart, right? Right. Because so you, the physician, and he, the husband, all have one interest at mind, and that's the welfare of Julie Jensen, right? That's what I thought. That's what you thought. Now, what if this jury had heard evidence that the reason that Mark Jensen was concerned about Julie Jensen not sleeping was because she was manifesting symptoms of antifreeze poisoning at 2 o'clock in the morning. And she was upset about that, and he wanted her to sleep through the effects of antifreeze poisoning. Now, what if the jury had heard evidence to that effect? If you had heard of information to that effect, you would not have prescribed Ambien in this case, would you? Judge, I would object as to speculation and argumentative, and it's an it's a hypothetical question, Your Honor. To a lay witness. Take it one step at a time, Mr. Jim. Okay. If Mark Jensen had told you, you know, I'm trying to poison my wife with antifreeze, <laughs> and she just won't die. She's, she's acting drunk, and then she's asking me questions about it, and I just want her to sleep through it. If he had told you that, you wouldn't have given him an Ambien, would you? Well, he didn't tell me that, and if he had told me that, I certainly wouldn't uh, do it. He would have I probably would have called the police about that. He would have that. called the sure. police. Yeah. So Mark Jensen, if in fact his purpose was to get the Ambien so his wife would sleep through the side effects of antifreeze poisoning, if in fact that was his purpose, he couldn't relate that to you, could he? Objection, argumentative. Overruled. Go ahead. A lot of ifs there. That, that wasn't what, uh, what I saw. That wasn't what he told you. Correct. I mean, there's a, in terms of, you know, that's a good point, doctor, and I, I, I hope you don't get the impression that I'm, that I'm going after you here. I mean, the, you, were a, you were a family physician. You were deeply concerned about the welfare of your patients. Correct. You, you, you loved your job, and you served your community in that capacity, and you did so honorably and with ethics and with concern for your patients. did. And by the way, I didn't say this, so I want to thank you for the service to, to your country in the Air Force. And I, and I want to thank you for your, your service to the people in this community as, as, a, as a family physician. That's honorable and important work. And I don't want to give you the impression that I'm in any way demeaning you at all for what you've done. I, Judge, I, I do think we have a question? I, you're going to get one. I just don't want him to get the impression that I'm going after him. Let's ask uh, the question. Now. So, so, doctor... You, you only have a certain amount of time to spend with each one of your patients, right? That's right. Because you're a very busy, you had a very busy practice. Right. 
And um, so you tried to get as much information from your patients as quickly as you could so that you could see to their needs and then move on to the next patient, right? Correct. And um, so, for example, when you were interviewing Julie um, on December 1st, 1998, you employed this, the, what is it called, the SIGE CAPS? It's an, an, an SIGE, S-I-G-E-C-A-P-S. That's a, um, an, an acronym, correct? SIGE CAPS? It's a mnemonic. Mnemonic, okay. For, for depression. Okay, right. and so it, we'll go through the, this, this, the alphabet one by one here as to these, the letters for SIGE CAPS. One is, the S is for sleep problems, correct? Correct. So when you're going through SIGE CAPS, with your patient, you're doing this as quickly as you can, so the first thing you ask about is sleep problems, correct? Sometimes, not all the time, yeah. Well, isn't that what side caps means? This is, what your, this is your shorthand process for assessing somebody for depression. I, I didn't put that in my note from that visit. But that's what you employed, correct? Side caps? Well, that's one of the things that I do, right. And, and when you interviewed Julie Jensen on December 1st, 1998, she didn't make any reference to any sleep problems, did she? No. And then the next thing, the I stands for interest, correct? Correct. And then the next thing is G, and that stands for guilt, correct? Correct. And then the next thing is E, and that stands for energy, correct? Correct. And the next thing is C, that stands for concentration, correct? Correct. And the next thing is appetite, and that stands for appetite, I mean A, that stands for appetite, correct? Correct. And then psychosocial retardation, that's the P stands for that, correct? Right. And then the final thing is S, and that stands for suicidal suicidality, correct? That's right. And so when you went through this side caps thing, that's what you do with your patients when you're assessing for depression, correct? Correct. And she had no sleep problems, correct? I don't remember if we talked about sleep. But Well, you didn't make any notations that she had sleep problems on December 1st, 1998, did you? I didn't. And if, you had, if she had mentioned to you that she had sleep problems, that's significant. That's something you would have written in your report, isn't it, or in your notes, correct? Wouldn't it change what I did at all or my impression? I, I, I understand, Doctor, and I'm, please understand. I'm not trying to criticize e even your notes, although I can't read them, but nobody can read my notes either, so we have that in common. Um, uh, but if she had told you that she had sleep problems, you almost certainly would have made a notation of that, don't you think? That's a significant thing. Well, right. And you didn't do that? There's only so much. I mean, it's limited. It's not a, it's not a word for word transcription of the uh, visit that we do. I understand that. You, I mean, you're, you're busy. In fact, I worked her in at the end of the morning um, because I thought she had something that, that really needed to be addressed. Yes. And um, during the course of that interview with her, she referred to marital problems. She alluded to an affair that she had in the past and felt that Mark had never really forgiven her for that. That's what she told you, correct? Correct. But she didn't tell you that during all the time that she tre you treated her, she didn't tell you that she'd been the object or the subject of a years-long pattern of sadistic. Judge, I'd object just to argumentative. It's the language. Well, why don't you tell the sadistic information that you're trying to ask? Okay. About? Well, let's let's put it this way. She didn't tell you that somebody had engaged in a pattern of repeated hang-up calls and leaving pornographic photos around the house and leaving pornographic allegedly leaving pornographic photos at her husband's place of business. Um, she never told you that, did she? Never did. Would you agree that if somebody I mean, it goes on for years. So let's take a look at Julie's notes concerning this. Did you know that Julie kept a log of the harassment that she was subjected to for years and years and years? Judge, I again would object as to Julie being subjected to. All of the testimony is that the calls were to the Jensen's home and that the photos were left at the Jensen home, including Mr. Jensen's vehicle. That's your interpretation. I we'll let the jury the make their own interpretation. I, I agree we all that. have our jobs here. Let the jury do their job. Judge, so I, the question will be allowed. So, doctor, I'm just going to show you. I, I, I'm going to show you something, and I'm going to ask you if Julie ever talked to you about this or she ever showed this to you. It starts on page 32 of this document in the upper left-hand corner, then through...
talk to me about that at all. And I never saw a log like that. So a log starting January 19th, 1992 of hang up fault calls and then pornographic photos being left around the house and penis photos being left around the house. She never told you about any of that. None of that. And if this went on for years and years and years and Julie didn't know who was doing this, that would, that would be upsetting to the normal person, wouldn't it? Yes. And if it was being done by Mark Jensen without Julie's knowledge, that would reflect a sadistic frame of mind on the part of the person who would do something like this to a person, don't you think? Judge, I would again object as to argumentative. Overruled, go ahead. That means yeah. you can answer? Yes. That, that would be, that, I mean, it was, if it was intended to humiliate and demean and embarrass Julie again and again and again from 1992 all the way through August of 1998, that reflects a high level of a sadistic intent on the, person, on the part of anybody who would do something like that to Julie Jensen. Right. Yeah, that'd be um, in the category of domestic violence for sure, psychological. Um. So this kind of psychological abuse that Julie was experiencing at anybody's hand, Julie hadn't told you about this during the time that she, she was your patient. Right. Now, do you have an independent recollection of Julie now as you sit here today? I'm sorry? Do, do you remember Julie? Do you remember what she was like? Do you remember anything about Julie? Well, it, it, I saw her a number of times through the years in my office, right. I'm going to direct your attention to the television screen, doctor. Pardon me? I'm going to direct your attention to the television screen. I think that's the easiest one for you to see. Hmm. Is that the Julie Jensen that you remember? Uh, yes. And that's David? Yes. And that's and Doug Douglas? Douglas, sure. And you treated Julie, David, and Douglas, true? Did. And what... And you'd indicated that Julie seemed to you to be a very devoted mother? Yes. She loved her children dearly, didn't she? Seemed to. Now, going back to the treatment that you received, that Julie received, um, <clears throat> on June 19th, 1998, of your notes, actually, let's we'll start with September 29th, 1997. Do you have, do you have to see that part of your notes, sir? I do. And on September 29th, 1997, um, you've got her, her name, her telephone number, and then URI. And what is that? That stands for Upper Respir Respiratory Tract Infection. Correct. Um, has gone into chest, um, PND plugged. Post-nasal discharge. Yeah. Weight on chest. Now, tell me, doctor, and then... And then um, on June 19, 1998, sinus headache, wheezy, ch chest convec convec congestion, congestion, correct? Correct. No fever, um, sinus infection, and bronchitis. Now tell me this, doctor. You also knew that Mark Jensen was a heavy smoker, correct? I did. And... Um, did you know, did Julie complain to you that he, he would smoke in the house and she couldn't get him to stop smoking in the house? I don't remember talking about that. Well, if in fact Mark Jensen is a heavy smoker and he smokes cigars and cigarettes and he smoked them in the house, um, might that account for the continuing cough that, Douglas, that David was experiencing? Could contribute. That would certainly be an exacerbating factor, wouldn't it? Yes,
So you traded Julie Jensen for years, is that true? From 93 until her death. And she complained about um, some measure of depression in September 21st, 1998. Is that true? Is that true? True. She never complained about de depression in any of the years before that. Um, not, not while I was taking care of her. And then she complained about, um, on December 1st, 1998, she said she was depressed and she said there were marital problems, correct? Correct. But she didn't tell you what all the marital problems were, did she? Right. She didn't tell you that her husband, Mark Jensen, uh, that she suspected he was having an affair with another woman. I don't remember. She didn't tell you that part of the marital problems was she suspected her husband was trying to poison her. She definitely didn't tell me that. She didn't tell you that she suspected that her husband was going on all these business trips so he could be away with his lover. Did not. And when you talked to Mark Jensen on December 2nd, 1998, he didn't tell you anything about his girlfriend on the side, did he? Did not. So on November 20, was it November 25th that um, Julie had contacted you about trying to get an appointment to, for a specialist for, for David? Correct. Was she, did she, Julie tell you that the reason she was able to do that is because Mark finally gave her permission to talk to you about having David see a specialist? Did not. Now, when you prescribed the Ambien when you gave the, the Ambien to Mark Jensen, you didn't tell him to give her Ambien as soon as he got home that day, did you? I did not. Did you, were you aware that's what he did? As soon as he got home, he gave her Ambien? Objection assumes a fact, not in evidence. Overruled, go ahead. It's in the interview, Your Honor. Overruled. So, so um, were you aware that as soon as he got home, he gave her some Ambien? Didn't know that. Did you, did, were you aware that he gave her another dose of Ambien that night? Did not know that. Did you know that as soon as she woke up the next morning, he gave her another dose of Ambien? Didn't know that either. On the morning of December 3rd and throughout the night of December 3rd, 1998, the early morning hours of December 3rd, 1998, were you aware that Julie was laying in bed unconscious and breathing like this? <gasps> did anybody tell you that? No. When you saw Mark Jensen at Julie's funeral, did he tell you that? Mentioned that she was breathing um, heavily. Did you ask him at that funeral? Well, gee, Mark, I told you if her condition worsened, you should take her to the emergency room or call me. Did you did you confront him with that? No. But you did tell him that when you saw him on December second. You told him if her condition deteriorated, he should call the emergency room and take her to the hospital. I did. And you are aware now from other sources that in fact her condition clearly deteriorated quite substantially. It didn't it? I did. On the morning of December 3rd, 1998, would it surprise you to know that Mark Jensen told a variety of people that Julie Jensen couldn't speak? Didn't know that. That she was too weak to get out of bed? Didn't know that either. That she had to be propped up in bed so her children could kiss her goodbye when they went to school? He didn't tell you that? No. That the children begged him to take mommy to the doctor or call an ambulance? He didn't tell you that? No. He didn't tell you that after that he told him, well, if mommy doesn't get better, we'll take her, we'll call an ambulance when you get home from school. He didn't tell you that, did he? Nope. If Mark Jensen had told you, if he'd called you on the morning of December 3rd, 1998, and said, 
My wife can't get out of bed. She's comatose. She's non-responsive. She, she's too weak to get out of bed. You would have told him to call the ambulance or rush her to the emergency room, wouldn't you have? Definitely. But Mark Jensen didn't call you on the morning of December 3rd, 1998, did he? No. He didn't call the emergency room, did he? I, I don't know. In, in 1998, we had an effective 911 system in the Kenosha County, didn't we? Right. If you call 911, they'll dispatch an ambulance, correct? Correct. In fact, on the afternoon of December 3rd, 1998, when Mark Jensen reported Julie's death, the emergency room, the, the paramedic arrived within two minutes of receiving the phone call. Were you aware of that? No. So certainly paramedic services are very much available, and they were available on December 3rd of 1998. Yes. And Mark Jensen, on December 3rd, 1998, after listening to his wife, gasping for breath, struggling to breathe, wake, waking up, finding her semi-comatose, and unable to get out of bed, and unable to walk, he did not one damn thing. Judge, Isn't I would object that as, true? I would object as to argue We will sustain that. Well, on the morning of December 3rd, 1998, he didn't call you? No. He didn't call 911? I don't know. He didn't take her to the hospital. Judge, this is all asked and answered. Well, he can ask the questions one by one. I sustained his objection. Go ahead. I didn't hear anything from the second until I saw the obit in the paper. Didn't, didn't hear anything. No and phone calls, nothing. When you saw the obit in the paper, you were shocked and deeply, deeply saddened, weren't shocked. you? Yes. You knew Julie Jensen. I did. What a terrible loss for her family, correct? at least for her children, correct? Definitely. You were unaware that in October of 1998, Mark Jensen was planning to go on a cruise with his girlfriend in October of 1999. You d he didn't tell you that, did he? No. And um, if assuming that is true, and the jury's heard evidence that that is the case, he was going on a cruise in October of 1999 with Kelly Labonte. You don't imagine he was planning on bringing his wife, Julie, with him, do you? So sometime between October of 1998, when he was planning, proposing this cruise to his girlfriend, Kelly Labonte, and October of 1999, when he was planning to go on this cruise with Kelly Labonte, he had to do something about Julie Jensen, didn't he? Judge, objection, argument. Sustained. So you never prescribed Librium for Julie Jensen, did you? I prescribed that for Mark. Mark had the prescription for Librium. Would it surprise you to know that at the time of her death, Julie had Librium in her system? Yes. Would it, it, it wouldn't surprise you to know that she had paroxetine in her system. I gave that to her. It wouldn't surprise you to know that she had paroxetine in her system. And Ambien. And Ambien. She had Ambien in her system. Right. But you would really surprise you to know that she had antifreeze in her system. Objection, Judge. Argumentative. <coughs> Overruled. Go ahead. <laughs> that was a surprise. Thank you, Dr. Borman. I don't have any further questions. Do you have a uh, lot of redirect? I have a sh How much? I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 minutes, Judge. Let's take a short break, okay. folks. Let's take a 10 minute break.
Right, for the jury. We're back on the record, Mark Jensen, 2002 CF314. The appearances are the same. The jury is back in the courtroom. Uh, Dr. Richard Borman is still on the stand. He's still under oath. And Ms. Krause, you can start your redirect. Thank you, Judge. Dr. Borman, I want to go back to something you testified to on cross. You were asked about Librium. Do you remember that? Yes. And who did you prescribe Librium to? Mark. And it's your understanding from Attorney Jamboy's questions that Julie Jensen had Librium in her system at the time of her death. That's what I understand. Um, did you have other conversations with Mark and Julie Jensen about using each other's medications, if you remember? No. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 109. Which one page? So it starts at. been marked as Exhibit 109 and refer you to June 8th of 1990. Can you tell whose medical record that is? So, yeah, June 8th, 98, um, phone call by Julie regarding Mark. Um, Mark had been using her cat cataflam, which is an anti-inflammatory for headaches. And, uh, Current problem with nipples itching and swollen, one hour taking the cataflam. Duration for 12 to 24 hours could be med-related, and I said yes. And so our recommendations, try Tylenol, or I gave a prescription for ANSAID, which is a different, A-N-S-A-I-D, which is a different kind of anti-inflammatory. So in June of 1998, this is a note regarding a call that you had with Julie Jensen. Julie called and talked to one of my staff members generated the note, and then I looked at it and responded. And that was about Mark using her medication? Yes. I'm going to refer you to the top of that page. Is there another call from Julie Jensen about Mark Jensen? Yes. And what's the date of that call? That one is uh, um, kind of cut off, but it looks like uh, March 2nd of 98. And yes. what is the nature of that call? The nature of that call. Uh, Julie called regarding Mark. He put <laughs> washable marker on his face. It didn't wash off with soap and water. Used uh, Castrol Super Clean, a uh, caustic agent that caused a chemical burn, painful, looks like sunburn, not blistered or weepy. What should we do? Um, uh, and then kept them awake most of the night. So um, I discussed, I did call back and talk with Julie and uh, suggested cool moist compresses and gave him a prescription for a mild uh, steroid cream to put on the, on the burn. Dr. Berman, was it unusual in 1990 or 1991 to talk to one spouse about another spouse? Every family is different, but that's a fairly common deal. Especially when the wife is at home and the husband is working, <laughs> oftentimes that would happen. Any objection from the state? <clears throat> no, Your Honor. All right, proceed. Dr. Berman, one of the other things that you were asked on cross was about David Jensen and his tics. Correct. And you were asked if there was somebody who smoked inside the house, if that could contribute to a cough. Yes. And you knew Mark to be an avid smoker. Is that what you testified to? Well, uh, I didn't know how much he was smoking. I knew he smoked. And, and then I put a note in there about cigars, too. So, and, but, yeah. And you continued to treat Mark after December of 1998. For a while, yes. And he continued to smoke. 
as far as I know, yeah. And I think you testified previously that in the spring of 1999, David Tix had gone away. Yes. You were also asked on cross-examination about referring David to a specialist, I think it was November 25th of 1998. Right. And do you remember what specialist that was that you were going to refer him to in November of 25, 1998? Yeah. Um, well, first the uh, ear, nose, and throat, and then the allergist. Then there was a neurologist, a pediatric neurologist that I, uh, I use quite often, but he was out of their network. And so then we talked to the people at Children's, um, uh, a resident and a, and a physician, about uh, making a referral up there. November 25th of 1998, was that the first time you ever referred David Jensen to a specialist? Don't remember. Do you remember if you had referred him to a specialist, um, to the allergist and the ear, nose, and throat prior to that date? I thought I did, but I'd have to see the record. And he had actually gone to those specialists, correct? I don't know. I'm going to... Um, if I give you a copy of your prior testimony, would that refresh your recollection? Sure. What page, counsel? Page nine. <laughs> lines eight through the next page, lines nine. <clears throat> So I don't remember seeing the reports, but apparently he did see a couple of specialists locally. Yes. Yes. You had actually been treating um, David Jensen through 1997 and 1998 for these ticks. Correct. And I think one of your notes from Julie Jensen at her interval appointment in 1998. September 21st, 1998, one of the first things you talked about, I think you told this jury, was David's ticks. Correct. This was an ongoing conversation with the Jensen family. With Julie, yep. She's the one that, was she the one that brought David to those appointments? Yes. And was she the one that talked to you about how you could help him with his ticks? Yeah. And was she brainstorming with you ways to address the coughing and the ticks? Objection. Counsel's leading the witness. Just rephrase it. Was Julie Jensen talking to you about options as it related to treating David Jensen? She was very concerned and wanted to do something to get him better. And that was, was that throughout 1997 and 1998? I think so. Was that from, are you, do you think so from the refreshing your recollection from the notes? From, yeah, my, my testimony. The other thing you talked about on cross was that Julie Jensen didn't tell you about these phone calls and pornographic images? Not at all. Um, you did talk to her, though, on December 1st about domestic violence. Right. And you discussed with her um, whether she was the victim of domestic violence. Right. I didn't go through every scenario of every kind of domestic violence, but she didn't say anything about any threats to her life, any poisoning, any, any you know, intimidation, anything like that. Um, and I think you were asked on cross about whether Mr. Jensen advised you on December 2nd whether he was having an affair. I didn't talk about that, no. And you don't, do you have any knowledge about when the affair started or when the affair ended? Not at all. Do you know if the affair ended prior to December 2nd, 1998? I don't know that. <clears throat> On December 1st, 1998, who was in the office when you were talking to Julie Jensen? 
um, in, in the room, just Julie and I. That was it. And, you know, my staff was there um, to check her in, but, and, and they all noticed that she was upset too and concerned, but the interaction was just between the two of us in an exam room. And was it based on that interaction between just you and Julie that you made the diagnosis of depression? Yes. And was it based upon that diagnosis that you provided her the medication? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Borman. I have nothing further. Do you have any recross, Mr. Chamblee? Uh, no recross, Your Honor. Uh, we need to make sure the any exhibits over by the doctor. <coughs> we have nothing there. Okay, you're you free to go. Thank you. We have all the exhibits we used on the table, right? I believe so. All right. Okay. Uh, next witness. Judge, we are going to play a video for Miss Dawn Cooper. I'm going to add it to Exhibit 104. And that's number six. And how long is the video? I believe it's 30 minutes. Um, prior to playing the video, because the entire video doesn't represent the beginning of the transcript, Attorney Renner is going to read the beginning of the transcript. All I think right. it's five minutes of reading. Let's do that. Okay. Hold on. Let me get the... Get the, um, the Again, this is Lori Brown. Uh, no. Don Cooper. Don Cooper. What numbers, uh, Cooper? <coughs> this is Don Cooper. Correct. Madam Clerk, is it okay if I add this after we play it? It's just downloading slow onto the drive. You want to play the video first? And then add it to All the right. drive? Okay. Ms. Cooper being duly sworn. Question. Could you please state your name and spell your name for the court? Answer. Dawn, D-A-U-N, Cooper. C-O-O-P-E-R. Question. Ms. Cooper, what do you do for work? Answer. I work for a stock brokerage firm. Question. Who do you work for? Answer. Stiffel Nicholas. Question. And where is that? Answer. In St. Louis, Missouri. Question. Do you live in St. Louis? Answer. I live across the river in Illinois. Question, did you just fly up here today for this proceeding? Answer, yes, sir. Question, how long have you worked for Stiffel Nicholas? Answer, um, I had worked there for previously for 11 and a half years, and I've been back there for about a year and a half now. Question, what are your job duties? Answer. I'm a sales assistant to a broker. Question, and what is what does that entail, being a sales assistant to a broker? Answer, kind of like being a wife. Um, you do everything. Work with the clients, answer questions, make sure things get done, if funds need to be wired, that kind of thing. Checks issued, whatever. Question. Do you have a broker's license to be a sales assistant? Answer, it's not required, but I do. Question, you do have a broker's license? Answer, yes, I am registered. Question, what kind of license do you have? Answer, series 7 and 64, I'm sorry, 63. Question, what does a Series 7 license allow you to do? Answer, I could be a stockbroker, buy, sell, contact clients, research, suggest stocks, that kind of thing. Question, so having a Series 7 license in itself would allow you to be the broker rather than the assistant? Answer, if I wanted to, yes, sir. Question. 
question. You've simply, you've chosen to do the assistant job rather than being a broker. Answer, that's correct. Question, were you, were you working at Stiffel Nicholas in 1998? Answer, yes, I was. Question, how long had you been there at that time? Answer, um, about 10 years. I went to work there in November of 88. Question, what was, your, what was your job position at that time in 1998? Answer, at that time, I was a registered sales assistant also. But in my, addition to my duties, I assisted with the, what they call the transition team. And they would borrow me whenever we were opening a new branch or had a new broker coming in as needed. Question, what would, what would you do as part of the transition team? Answer, um, we would assist in paperwork, getting accounts opened, answering questions for the brokers that had come in. If it was a new branch, setting up the cashiering office, whatever needed to be done, basically. Answering whatever they needed. Question, and in, in 1998, did you have occasion to come to Wisconsin to open any, any new offices as part of a transition team? <coughs> Answer, um, in 98, I was in Appleton. Question, in Appleton, Wisconsin, opening an office? Answer, it was a new office in Appleton, yes. I think I was also in Oshkosh for a short period of time. Question, okay, there was an office that opened in Racine that year as well? Answer, mm-hmm. Question, you have to say yes for the court reporter. Answer, oh, yes. Question. And did you help in opening that office? Answer, no, I was not part of that one. Question, is there a, a conference that's held annually for Stiffel Nicholas called the Blueprint Conference? Answer, yes, sir. Question, do you recall when that was held in 1998? Answer, it was in November sometime. I don't remember when, I just know it was in November. Question, prior to November 1998, did you know, or prior to the Blueprint Conference, did you know a person named Ed Klug? Answer, yes. Question, how did you, how did you know Mr. Klug? Answer, because I was involved in opening and helping with the Appleton branch when they came over to Stiffel. Question, was Mr. Klug a manager of that branch? Answer, he was a co-manager. They actually have two managers there. Question, how many times did you, had you met Mr. Klug prior to that Blueprint conference? Answer, as I recall, I think I was there twice. Question, were you there the weekend that the office opened? Answer, no, I went afterwards to help out. Question, did you go by yourself or did you go as part of a team? Answer, I was there I think both times, yeah, I was by myself. Question, so you came up from St. Louis on two occasions in October of 1998 to work on the transition of that office? Answer, yeah, it was either September or October, right around in there. The court, I beg your pardon, I didn't hear you ma'am. The witness. It was either September or October, I don't remember exactly. Question, but you were not there for the weekend when they first, they first opened? Answer, no, I was not. Question, you were aware that people from the transition team came up for like an opening weekend or to make the initial transition? Answer, yes sir. Question, prior to the and were those the only times that you had met Ed Klug prior to the Blueprint Conference? Answer, as far as I can remember, I don't think he was in St. Louis for anything else, so I don't think I had seen him any other time than up there in the branch. Question, okay. And prior to this Blueprint Conference in November 1998, had you ever met Mark Jensen 
the man here to my left? Answer. I don't think I had actually met Mark prior to that, but I'm not positive. But to my, the best I can recall, I actually physically met him that weekend. Question. So you did meet Mr. Jensen at the Blueprint Conference? Answer, yes. Question. Did you also see Mr. Klug at the Blueprint Conference? Answer, yes, sir. Question. And is there a a night at the at this blueprint conference where there's a dinner for everybody from Stiffel Nicholas? Answer. Um, it's mostly for the brokers, but they do invite various people in management and so forth, and some of the departments to come. It kind of depends on what's going on at the time. Question. How many people attend this dinner? Answer. Several hundred. It's all the brokers that come in from all of the branches that Stiffel has. Question, do you know what night of the conference this usually would take place? Answer, I think that year it was a Friday night as I recall. Question, did you attend that Friday night dinner? Answer, I did not go to the dinner, no. Question, did you, and where did this take place? Where was the dinner? Answer, I think it, the dinner was at the same facility where they were staying, but I'm not positive because I didn't go to it, which is at a Marriott Hotel in St. Louis. Question. Was that where the meetings were and where the brokers were generally staying, staying at this Marriott Hotel? Answer. That's my understanding. I, I can't remember. Yeah. We were in our old office back then, so I don't think they held anything at the office as best I can remember. I think everything was there at the, in the conference rooms. But like I said, I didn't attend them, so I can't say for sure. Question. Okay, did you have an occasion to go to the Marriott Hotel after dinner was held that night? Answer, yes, I did. Question. And can you tell me when you arrived at the Marriott in St. Louis? Answer, I don't remember exactly. My best guess would be somewhere between 9 and 10 o'clock because after the dinner, they were all going, a bunch of them anyway, were going to the bar that's located there in the hotel. Question, there's a bar in the lobby of the Marriott? Answer, correct, it's like a club. Question, did you go down there to meet these fellow Stiffel Nicholas employees? Answer, correct. Question, and your best guess is that you arrived between 9 and 10? Answer, best I remember because I didn't go to the dinner. Question, what did you, what did you do over the next several hours after you arrived? Answer, we were in the bar and talked. I mean, I knew a lot of the people that were there. Some people I worked with, management, some of the transition team was there. Several of the brokers I had worked with in transitions in several branches were there. It was just, it was kind of just a mingle, or, you know, everybody was just doing their own thing. Okay, were there, how many people were in the bar? Do you have any idea? Answer, oh, geez, several hundred? I would say if I had to guess two or three hundred, I really don't know. Question, it was crowded? Answer, at the first, at the beginning it was. Question, and, and you were consuming alcohol while you were there? Answer, yes, yes sir. Question, was Ed Klug there at the bar? Answer, yes sir. Question, was Mr. Jensen there at the bar? Answer, yes. Question, do you know a woman named Kelly who is named Kelly Labonte? Answer, yes I do. Question, do you know if she was there? Answer, she was. Question, do you recall if she was with her husband? Answer, I don't remember. Question, and how late did you stay at the, at the Marriott bar that night? Answer, I'm sorry? Question, how late did you stay at the Marriott bar that night? Answer, until they closed, which would have been 2 o'clock. Question, 
so you were there, you were there until two o'clock. Who else was still there that you recall at the end of the night? Or I guess initially, let me ask you, how many people generally were still around? Answer, not a lot. A lot of people had left. They were going home, I think, the next day. Um, I really don't know. I mean, if I had to take a guess, I'd say between maybe 25 and 50. I don't know. You know when you're kind of with people, you're talking, you don't notice a lot of times? But it was late, so, you know, that would be my guess. Question. Okay. And was Mr. Jensen still there? Answer. Yes, sir. Question. Was Mr. Klug still there? Answer. Yes, sir. Question. What did you... What did you do after the, the bar closed? Answer, we left and went out into the lobby or seating area there at the hotel. Question, who did, I think you said we, who is we? Answer, I know that Mark Jensen was there, Ed Klug was there. I'm not positive, I think Ron Ruck may have been there. Question, who is Ron Ruck? Answer, as far as the people I was talking with anyway. Question, okay. There may have been other people in the lobby? Answer, yes. Question, but you were with Mark Jensen, Ed Klug, and perhaps Ron Ruck? Answer, I think so. And there may have been one other person, but I honestly don't remember and I can't say positively. Question, and Mr. Ruck was the co-branch manager of that Appleton office? Answer, yes, sir. Question, had you met him when you were in the Appleton, though? Answer, yes, sir. Question, what did you then do in the lobby at the Marriott Hotel? Answer, um, honestly, I had several drinks, and they were concerned about me driving and had taken my keys. And so we sat down for a while so that I could basically sober up where I was more able to drive. So we sat and talked. Question, now who is, who was sitting there and talking? Answer, um, Mark Jensen and Ed Klug, I think. I think Ron Ruck was there for a little while. Question, did, how long did Mr. Ruck stay? Answer, I don't know positively. Like I said, I believe he was still there. But if he was, it wasn't very long. Question, oh, answer best I can recall. Question, is it your recollection that Mr. Ruck was there initially in the lobby, but he left earlier than the rest of the people? Answer, I believe so. Question, and I'm sorry, somebody, who took your keys? Answer, initially Kelly Labonte had taken them from me. Question, earlier in the night? Answer, yes. Question, was she there at 2 a.m.? Answer, no, I believe she'd already left. Question, who had, your, who had your keys then as you talked in the lobby? Answer, she had given them to Mark Jensen. Question, so the three of, ultimately it's the three of you talking there. Answer, um, like I said, best I remember it was. It was eventually just the three of us. Question, how long did you talk in the lobby of the Marriott? Answer, you know, I mean, it's been over nine years. Uh, I would say it had to have been at least an hour is my best guess. Question, and can you tell me the nature of the conversation that you were having with Mr. Klug and Mr. Jensen was? Answer, um, as I recall, we discussed some business stuff. We discussed the firm. They were new to Stiffel, um, you know, so how they were liking it, that kind of thing. We also discussed some personal things. I had, at that time, I was going through a divorce, and I was upset that evening, and we talked about that. But I really don't recall anything other than that. Question. You were talking about your divorce? Answer, yes, sir. Question. Were you talking about Mr. Jensen's or Mr. Klug's marriages? Answer, not specifically. It was more about what I was going through. And they were, you know, very supportive, I guess is the word for it. 
Um, the only thing I recall is, you know, if I had said something about, and I cannot tell you the specifics, I just recall it was the kind of thing where, like I said, you know, he's been doing this, and they'd say, yeah, I understand, I've been through this and that with my spouse kind of thing. But I don't recall anything specific. It was just one of those types of conversa types conversations. Question. Were both Mr. Jensen and Mr. Mr. Klug there throughout the time you were there? Did either of them leave at any point? Answer. Mr. Klug left at one point uh, to talk to his wife. I couldn't tell you what time it was. I just remember him getting up and leaving to go speak to his wife. And I don't even know where he went. I don't remember. I just remember him leaving as to go talk to his wife. Question, did he return at some point? Answer, yes, sir. Question, did you ultimately drive home that night or that evening, Mrs. Cooper? Answer, yes, sir, I did. Question, what time would it have been when you left? Answer, my best guess again is somewhere between 3 and 3.30. Like I said, I, I would think we were there at least an hour or that I was there at least an hour. Question, at any time that you were present in the lobby of the Marriott Hotel in November of 1998, did Mark Jensen say anything about harming his wife? Answer, no sir, I did not hear anything like that. Question. At any time while you were present at the Marriott Hotel in November of 1998, did Mark Jensen say anything about using the computer to look up ways to harm his wife? Answer, no, sir. Question, if Mr. Jensen had talked about harming his wife, is that something you would have remembered? Answer, absolutely. Question, is there any particular reason that you would remember that kind of thing? Answer, well, other than the obvious, Kelly Labonte and I were very good friends, and you know, she was friends with Mark at the time, and I would have been concerned for her if I had heard. But I mean, even if it weren't for that, I would have said something anyway. Question, that is, a comment about harming someone's wife would have been so unusual and provocative that you believe you would have acted on it? Answer, yes, sir. Question, if you had heard that? Answer, yes, sir. And in addition, because you were friends with Ms. Labonte, you believe you would have taken special note that someone close to her was making this kind of comment? Answer, yes, sir. Question, were you, were you aware at the time whether they were having an affair? Answer, no, I did not know. Question, were you aware that they talked frequently? Answer, yes, I knew they were friends. Question, you indicated that you were friends with Kelly Labonte? Answer, yes, sir. Question, how long had you been friends with her? Answer, a while. She worked in the same office where I worked. Um, we had other friends that we, other friends we ran around with. And then she and I did things also, you know, outside of work. Um, as I recall, I don't think Kelly had been at the firm that long, so we kind of became friends not long after she came there. I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly when we became friends, but for a while. I would say at that point, probably since the summer at least. I just don't remember the time frame. Question, and are you certain at no, that at no time did Mark Jensen ever say anything about harming his wife? Answer. No, sir, I did not hear anything like that. Question, and are you certain about that? Answer, yes, sir. Question, at some later point, did you have any conversation with Mr. Klug about Mr. Jensen? Not, not later that, well, let me, actually let me finish that, finish up that night, Ms. Cooper. Answer, okay. Question, when you left that night, can you tell me how that, how that came about or what happened when you left? Answer, um, I was finally to a point where I was, we all felt safe to drive. And Mark gave me my keys, asked me if I was sure I was able to drive and I said yes. And they walked me to the door of the hotel and I left and went home. Question, Mr. Klug and Mr. Jensen had walked you to the door of the hotel? 
Answer, I believe Mr. Klug, yes. Question, did Mr. Jensen? Answer, yes, they were both there as best I can recall. Question, was there any discussion about you staying at the hotel rather than driving home? Answer, yes. And Mark Jensen had, was concerned about me driving and he offered to get me a room there at the hotel to stay because he was concerned about me driving home, but I declined. Question, you decided that you were okay to drive? Answer, yes, sir. Question, after that night, did you have a, ever have a conversation with Mr. Klug about Mr. Jensen? Answer, I'm about him specifically? Not that I recall until the day that they actually charged him. Question, okay, well then tell me, did you have a conversation with Mr. Jensen after, I mean with Mr. Klug after Mr. Jensen was charged in this case? Answer, we did the day that he was charged, yes. Question, and tell me, tell me what took place in that conversation. Answer, I was no longer working at Stiffel and I was working out of a branch. I worked for another brokerage firm at that time and it was working out of Rockford, Illinois for a few weeks. And got a phone call from Mr. Klug. He asked me if I had talked to Kelly lately and I said no. Did it and I don't remember how long it had been. And I said why and he said have you heard the news? And I said no, what are you talking about? And he said that they had charged Mr. Jensen and we talked for a minute or two and I told him I was going to go, that I wanted to call Kelly and check on her. So it was a very brief conversation. Question, did Mr. Klug say anything to you about any claimed conversation in St. Louis in November 1998? Answer, no sir, it was a very brief conversation. Question, at any time did he ever talk to you about any conversation you had that night in the lobby of the Marriott Hotel? Answer, no sir. After this line. <laughs> Question, and I take it Ms. Cooper, at no time when you had this conversation in Rockford, when you were in Rockford, and this was by telephone, right? And I believe this is where the video picks up. That was more than five minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to be clear and concise I in, understand. My, in my talking. <laughs> All right, let's play the video. time when you had this conversation uh, in Rockford, when you were in Rockford, and this was by telephone, right? Correct. Uh, did Mr. Klug uh, say anything uh, about a conversation in which Mark had talked about harming his wife? No, sir. And you didn't say anything to him that Mark had ever had any such conversation, correct? No, sir. You had never heard such conversation, so you would not have been able to mention it. That's correct. How is it that Mr. Klug knew how to find you in uh, Rockford, and uh, this would have been March 2002? Whenever, right, I don't remember the exact okay. year. If yes. I told you that there was evidence in this case that Mr. Jensen was charged in March 2002, then you, then you would know that it was at that time? Right. And were you in Rockford in that period of time? Yes, sir. How did Mr. Klug know to find you there since you were no longer working for Stiefel Nicholas and uh, were now working out of Rockford? Um, he had my cell phone number and we would talk, I don't know, periodically, which is not unusual with brokers you work with. Sometimes if they have a question and can't find an answer, they'll give you a call. And, and at any time during these periodic conversations, did he ever say anything about having an unusual conversation with Mr. Jensen? No, sir. Did you ever say anything about Mark talking about harming his wife? No, sir. Uh, when's, the, when's the next time? Uh, at some point, you were contacted about this, this matter. Is that right? About? In, in 2007? About the comment, you mean? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, Tell me, tell me when you were contacted in 2007 about this matter. It would have been um, July of 2007. And do you recall when in July? It was 
um, the week of the 25th, and I know that because it was my boyfriend's birthday, and I was actually on vacation when I was contacted because I was planning his birthday party. And what day of the week was it? Um, it was a Friday. So Friday at the end of the week of July 20, that included July 25th? Correct, which I think the 25th was a Wednesday, if I remember correctly. Okay, so you probably July 27th. Yes, sir. Uh, and what occurred on that day? Um, I was running errands and got a phone call from a girl that I work with who said she had been contacted at the office by someone who was trying to get in touch with me. And I asked her what it was regarding. She didn't know. And I said, well, I'll you know, talk to him Monday because I, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize it was anything urgent. And so she called me back on my cell, I guess, I don't remember, maybe 45 minutes, maybe an hour later. And they had called again and it said it was imperative that they talk to me. So I got the phone number from her and called. Okay, and who, who was it that you, that you called? Um, it was the, um, I guess it's the district attorney in Milwaukee. Or in Kenosha? I guess, I'm sorry, I don't know where, I, wherever he's located. Sorry. <laughs> okay, um, but you had a number for a district attorney's office? She had um, a female's name, and I don't recall the name, and a phone number. Okay, and what happened when you called that number? And um, when I called, I was put on, I guess, like a speaker phone, and it was um, the lady who had called at my office and um, the district attorney. And then what was said? They asked me, um, had I been present, um, that they had been given information that I was present. Um, I, I think he said something about being when we were out for drinks, and there was a comment made, did I recall the conversation? And I told him I did not. And then was there further conversation? He asked me, I, he's, I said, well, I, actually, let me back up. I asked him at that point to please be a little bit more specific because it wouldn't, it wasn't like I was with some of these people just one time for drinks, you know? Um, and I'm trying to think, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember how the conversation went. He asked, I asked him to be more specific. He said it was, um, over drinks and that Ed Klug was present and Mark Jensen was present. And I, once again said I needed to be a little more specific because I had been with them before and he said that um, a comment had been made eventually it came down to that a comment had been made about Mark um, harming his wife I think is how he put it and did I recall that and I said no I didn't and this this question was in the context of, of uh, asking you that they had understood that you were present when this comment was made right and what happened after you told them that you were not present for any such uh, conversation? Um, I was just told that this was a murder investigation, was I sure? And I said, yes, that I would recall something like that and that I didn't recall it. And that was the end of the conversation, best I remember. And that remains the case today, that you remember no such conversation? Yes, sir. And you're confident that you would remember such conversation if it had ever taken place in the presence of Ed Klug and Mark Jensen? Yes, sir. And at no time did Mark Jensen ever talk to you uh, about harming or killing his wife or looking up things on the computer about killing his wife? No, sir. Uh, when was the last time you, had, you spoke with Kelly? I'm not positive exactly. We lost touch, basically. Um, I know I talked to her um, when Mark Jensen was charged. Um, I actually met her partway between, and I don't know where it was, somewhere between Rockford and Racine. Um, we had dinner and talked for a while. I think I talked to her a couple more times, maybe, after that. And she and I would email occasionally and um, it had been a while since I had had any contact with her, and I know that later on I tried to send her an email and it came back undeliverable, and she wasn't working there anymore. If I had to take a guess, I would say probably sometime, maybe fall of 2002, possibly 2003. I just don't remember. We just lost touch. Okay. You think it's you think it's been around five five years or so since you've had any contact with her? That would be my best guess. 
Thank you, Ms. Cooper. The prosecutor may have some questions for you. Okay. Um, so, Ms. Cooper, what time is it? I'm sorry, Ms. Cooper, what time was it that you think you left the hotel that night? Um, my best guess, like I said, is somewhere between 3 and 3.30. Now, at that time, like, could it have been before 3 o'clock? I can't say positively, but I don't think it was. When was the first time anybody asked you about what time you left that hotel in November of 1998? Um, I guess it was in fall of 07, this past fall, like, I guess September-ish. So it was nine years later. Okay. Right. And um, you'd been drinking that evening? Yes, sir. And at some point, your friend Kelly Labonte took your keys because she would, didn't want you driving under those circumstances. Yes, sir. And um, do you know what time it was that Kelly Labonte took your keys? Um, I, I mean, I can't say positively. My guess would be a little after midnight. So, it was a while before the bar closed. I mean, it was, let's put it this way, it would have been at least an hour before the bar closed because I know she was, I believe she was getting ready to leave. And I don't know what time the bar closes. Do you know Two o'clock. Two o'clock, so. And she was getting ready to leave and that was when she took my keys. So sometime between midnight and one o'clock in the morning she took your keys? That would be my best guess. Like I said, it's been over nine years, so. And it was her impression that you were intoxicated at the time? Enough that she didn't think I should be driving. And you were in sufficient agreement with her on that point that you gave her your keys? No. <laughs> oh, you fought about getting it? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> And you're not the first intoxicated person to do that, right? No, I'm, not. Seen that I'm quite certain of that. <laughs> um, so she was looking out for your best interest. Yes, sir. And ultimately, you relented in letting her keep your keys. Sort of. <laughs> she so you, took them. <laughs> did, did you did you stop drinking alcohol at that point? Um, I I wouldn't. I can't say that's true. No. Oh, so you continue to drink alcohol after? I would say I probably had one more, maybe two at the most. Okay, so one or two more after your friend took yeah. the keys? I was to the point, I, I know, I remember I was, I distinctly remember in fact that I was emotional, so I knew I needed to stop. <laughs> emotional about um, her taking your keys or um. emotional about <laughs> the breakup of your relationship with your husband? Yes, sir, about my marriage. It was a rough time for me. And so you had too much to drink and mm -hmm. you were... And you were emotional and and you were venting somewhat about your, your husband, correct? Yes. And who were you venting to? Um, at that time, you mean? Who yes, at the time that you were emotional and venting, who were you venting to? Oh, probably anybody that would listen. <laughs> anybody that listen? No, I'm kidding. Um, there were a lot of people there I knew, but at that time I recall that Mark was standing there, Mark Jensen, and um, Kelly was there. Um, there were a couple other people sta at that time standing there from our company. And we've all heard that from people that are going through a divorce where they're venting about the problems they had with their spouse. That's, yes. you've, you've heard that before too, right? Mm -hmm. you've, been, you've not just been in the de delivering and you've been in the receiving end of those yes, kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and ordinarily you find people are empathetic when I mean, you try to be empathetic with somebody in those circumstances. Sure. And, uh, in view of the problems you'd had with your previous relationship, you've perhaps got a lot of information to impart to somebody in that situation, right? I would say, yeah, I try not to, but yes, if and, they asked. <laughs> sure. And now you might not remember exactly what you were venting about mm -hmm. to your friends concerning your ex-husband, um, but I'll bet as you're sitting here today, you still remember the, the complaints you had about your, your husband, right? Yes, and it wasn't just that. It was also just the difficulty of going through the divorce. Sure. I was married 10 years, never thought I would be in that situation, and it was very sad for me. So it wasn't just complaining. It was, you know, that kind of thing, too. And I don't mean to raise up bad memories for you, but we are going to inquire into that. From Is that okay with you? Sure. Okay. Um, even though you don't remember what you were complaining to your friends about, uh, specifically, do you remember just sitting here today what your what your uh, what you felt was unfair about what was going on in your life at that time in terms of that relationship with your husband? Yes, sir. And I I know you probably don't mean any ill will toward your ex-husband, but no, for purposes don't. of this case, it may be helpful for us to inquire into that. So, what were some of your complaints about your ex-husband? Um. <laughs> He was very stubborn, difficult to deal with at times, not an open person, so it was hard to talk through things when you, the other person doesn't want to talk, that kind of thing. Well, 
I'll bet there are a lot of women that have that complaint about I'm their I'm sure there are. I mean, you, my wife and you could get together, I'm sure, and have shares. Um, so, but, so probably when you were complaining to your friends or talking to your friends or seeking empathy from your friends that night, probably that was one of the things that you were complaining about, that he was stubborn, not communicative, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I like to push my buttons. And um, when your friends were empathizing with you, um, did they relate some of the problems they'd been having in their relationships to? Yes, sir. And I mean, I can't tell you specifically. I don't recall. But I, I know it was one of those kind of conversations. And the, who were the people that were participating in that conversation? Um, Kelly was there, like I said. Um, to be honest, at that point, if you're talking about when my keys were taken away, is that what we're still discussing? Well, is, I guess we're talking about the time when you were complaining about your husband, but if that included when the keys were taken away, yes. Okay. Because let's, I know let's just at, go at from that, that point forward. Okay, because I know at that time it was more I was dealing with, um, I don't know how to do this, I don't know how to be single, it's not what I intended, you know, and, and I, I mean, I specifically remember Kelly telling me, you know what, you're going to be fine, you're going to make it, that kind of thing. And, you know, several of the others that were standing there, Mark Jensen and them, you know, same thing. And then later on, you started complaining more specifically about your, your spouse. Mm -hmm. And um, so then did the manner in which they were empathizing with you change? Instead of saying you're going to work your way through this, did they start sit, talking about their spouses? Yes, sir. Okay. So when you left the evening, that's what the conversation was. It was, I, I, I don't want to simplify and say it was spouse bashing, but really you, you were all sharing kind of war stories about your, your spouses. It was part of what we discussed that evening, yes. I mean, it wasn't the entire conversation, no. But I, that's what it turned to by the time you were leaving? I, I don't remember what is specifically we were talking about at the point when I left. It, we had been discussing it, yes. And then at some point you left? Yes, sir. And when you left, where did you leave from? I mean, where were you in the hotel at the time that you left? The same place we had been sitting. There was like a seating area where they have, you know, a couple of chairs and a love seat kind of thing. And what had you been drinking as you were sitting there before you left? Water. And um, <clears throat> was the bar closed or opened at that point? No, it was closed. And the bar closes at 2 a.m.? Yes, sir. And so you left sometime after the bar closed? Yes, sir. And your recollection at this point, your best recollection is that it could have been about an hour after the bar closed? Yes, sir. Uh, it could have been a little less, a little more. Yes, sir. And um, when you left, who was still sitting there talking to each other? Um, when I left, I know that Mark Jensen was there and Ed Clue was there, and they walked me to the hotel door, which was maybe from here to that door, and, if I had to guess. And then you left? Yes, sir. And you don't know what happened the rest of that evening? No, sir. Now, let's talk about you and Kelly Jensen, if we can. For our, at that time, it was Kelly Labonte, mm -hmm. right? Yes, Well, sir. actually, at that time in November of 1990, it was Kelly Greeman, correct? Oh, yes, sir. And um, did you attend Kelly's wedding? No, they did not get married in town. But you knew about Kelly's wedding? Yes. And at the time of Kelly's wedding, how long had you known Kelly? How many months or years had you known Kelly, if you know? It wasn't years, I know that, because she hadn't been at the firm that long. Um, and I honestly don't remember the time frame. I would say I'd known her, I just don't know, a few months. Well, did you two socialize after work on occasion? Yes, we did. Felt, did you feel as though you had something in common with Kelly? Yes, sir. And so you would get together after work and have a couple of drinks and talk? Sometimes, um, I recall one time I actually got together with she and her husband um, at a Joe's Crab Shack and had dinner with them. You and your husband, or just that, her and her husband? Her and uh, Kelly's husband. And when you went to the, the Crab Shack with Kelly and mm -hmm. her husband, was your husband along too or not? No. Uh, by this time, had your relationship with your husband started to go south, or was it just that your husband was otherwise engaged that evening? No, I think we were separated already, which would have been the first week of October, I believe. Um, when you and Kelly would get together and, and after work, um, would you discuss uh, your relationships with each other? Sure. So you would discuss how your relationship was going south? <coughs> yes, sir. When you first met Kelly, do mm -hmm. you know was she married at that time? Or she was, was not. So when you first met Kelly, she was still going by Kelly Labonte? Correct. And she had not yet married Mark Raymond? Correct. And at some point during the course of your 
friendship with Kelly Levante. She told you about her engagement to Mark Creeman? Yes, I knew she was seeing somebody and I knew she was engaged. <laughs> Okay, when you say she, when you say you knew she was seeing somebody and you knew she was engaged, did you know those to be two different people? Or? No. Okay. <laughs> when I met her, she was seeing someone, and I knew that she had gotten engaged. Okay. Now, at some point, did she tell you about her and Mark Jensen? As far as that she knew him, met him, or, or what? What? As far as she was having an affair with him. No, she did not. I did not know that until I didn't know there was anything. Let me rephrase that. I did not know specifically that they were having a romantic involvement until, if I had to take a guess, I would say that would have been 98. So I would have said, I would say around January, maybe February of 99, whatever that, yeah. So something after Julie Jensen's death is when you found out that they were having an affair? Yes, sir. Did you find out, how'd you find out about the affair? Well, Judge, well, this, this is calling for hearsay. State. Well, well, actually, it well, it, yeah, well, it will. I guarantee it. Even though it, you're not specifically asking for the hearsay, it'll come in, and so no. I'm not permitted to ask her how she found out about this affair. Uh, because it, it, in itself, the question suggests the existence of hearsay, so the answer is no. Well, when you found out about it, was it from one of the direct participants in the affair, or was it from somebody Judge. else? Just a minute. Sustain. Well, did, um, did you and Kelly Levante or Kelly Greenman ever discuss Kelly Greenman's relationship with Mark Jensen? I knew they were friends. I knew that she had gone there, and that's how she met him, and that they were friends. On the evening um, that this conversation occurred, where you were complaining about your spouse and Kelly took your keys, mm -hmm. that was, uh, was that a Friday night in November of 1998? Yes, I believe it was. And you recall Kelly being there? Yes, sir. Do you recall whether or not her husband was there, Mark Greenman? I don't remember exactly. That evening that you were drinking, did you notice whether or not Mark Jensen or Kelly Levant, Kelly Greeman or Ed Klug, did you notice whether they were drinking or not? Everybody was. I mean, I shouldn't say everybody. Yes, they were. But they were all staying at the hotel, right? Um, Mark Jensen was and Ed Klug was. <laughs> I don't have any further questions, thank you. You were asked some questions again about timing. As I understood it, your best recollection is 3 to 3.30. Yes, sir. In terms of conversation you had with, with Mr. Klug, was there any discussion about any relationship he had with the secretary? No, sir. Was there any, do you recall any conversation about his wife being being jealous? I don't recall. You were, the, the best part of the conversation you remember is what you were talking, you were talking about and then they were, they were registering sort of general, general grievances about their uh, marriage. Yes, sir. Do you think you were <coughs> intoxicated? to such a degree that you wouldn't remember if there had been some statement about killing one's wife? No, sir. Are you, I, I'm not did sure I if, we doubled, if we did double negative okay. uh, on that, but. No, uh, I don't, I was not so intoxicated that I think that I would not remember. Did that come out right? I would remember if I had heard it, put it that way. You don't have a blackout period from that time? No, sir. Uh, if there had been some conversation about harming one's wife, is that something that you would remember? Yes, sir. And, and whatever you had to drink would not interfere with that memory? No, sir. In this conversation you had with the district attorney's office, um, do I understand correctly that the first question you were asked said, we understand you were present during a conversation about harming one's wife? No, that's not how the first question was phrased. All right. 
Let me see if I can clarify this. Okay. Initially, 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 you were asked whether you were present during some conversation. Yes. And there was no specification regarding the type of conversation. No, sir. Not the first question. Okay. And then was there some clarification from the district attorney's office about what the conversation was about? After a couple of other questions, when I asked to be more specific. Because it, ca it came out of left field, and I had no idea what they were talking about at that time. And then when they asked a specific question, did they say something along the lines of, we understand you were present during a conversation in which Mr. Jensen discussed harming his wife? I, I honestly don't recall whether the phrasing was, we understand, we were given information, we were told. I don't remember. But it was that their understanding was that, I, I mean, that was the gist of it, was that I was present at that when this conversation took place. Okay. So you don't remember if it's, we understand, we were given information, we were told, but it's along those lines. Yes, sir. And then you told them that you had not been present for such a conversation. I said I never heard that comment. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Thank Nothing you. Nothing further, Governor. Thank you. And I take Ms. Cooper at no time. Okay, are we moving uh, some exhibits in? Yes, Judge, that is part of, I'll make that part of Exhibit 104. Okay. What do we have next then? Judge, we don't have another witness currently available and I can explain to the court the reason for it. You guys want to go home? Sure. <laughs> that was 8.30, folks. Don't talk about the case. <laughs> Um, who's, who's your witnesses for tomorrow then, Ms. Grosey? Um, it is going to be, I just told them. Are you going to have your experts you. here? I'm sorry? Are you going to have your experts here? Yes, so oh. Stacy Hale. Okay. Um, Detective Ratsberg. Monica Springetti. Um, Joanne Wise Colby couldn't be here today. She had surgery, so we're going to have to edit and play a video. Which number would that be? Joanne Wise Colby. Do you know what number she is? It's not off the top of my head. She's at the bottom of the list, though, because it's under Wise, I believe. Oh, I see 32. And then we have another, another video for an unavailable witness. When, when are you going to have Dr. Sarah West? Monday. Monday. She was originally scheduled for February 1st and did move up her flight to Monday. So then what do we have scheduled for Friday? We have um, Dr. Lindsay Thomas, Laura Coster, and Ed Ruck. Ron Ruck. Uh, Ron, Ron Ruck, not Ed Klug. Ron Ruck. <laughs> after we get done with Dr. West, um, any further witnesses after that? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. I think Monday, Judge, we have three witnesses total, and those are the people that couldn't rearrange flights. All right. Um, it's going to be Sarah West, Pam Dreyer, and David Jensen. And it's never too early to start thinking about jury instructions. You can start working on them, and so I, at least I can start looking at them. Okay. Um, just to give you a hint, we're contemplating the same ones as last time, Your Honor. I have those, but we should maybe put a different file number, or it's the same number. Same file, but different same judge. There we go. I knew I'd get the right answer after a while. <laughs> and different dates. <laughs> All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, still holding the jury. Uh,